Hey, welcome everyone uh, to another Pac-12 live chat show where you guys, the orphans of the Pac-12, are given a voice uh, in the world of college football. Again, we know there's great shows like Pigs and Pete's ACC show, and you can throw a rock and hit any SEC show out there. But this is the place where all of you Pac-12 fans can come join us anytime to talk about your team. Uh, we've got a lot of great games to talk about that just happened this week, as well as uh, week two and week three have some great matchups we'd like to talk about with you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and drop the StreamYard link in. We're going to see a little bit backwards right now. Tony's having a little bit of trouble, technical trouble. So we're going to do our show actually in reverse. I'm going to bring you guys on, and uh, we can talk about the, the previous week or any matchups you have coming up. So let me drop this in. And feel free to join me in that link right there. So overall, I think the Pac-12 did a great job representing themselves. Uh, we did really well. The game, the Utah game is the one that really is kind of the, the backbreaker for us. Uh, we did really, really well in that game. And it just seems like, you know, Cam Rising did the inexplicable. The one thing he couldn't do is throw that pick, uh, which was a, a bit of surprise. Uh, you know, a veteran guy like Rising to make that throw on second down really was a dagger. Um but let's, let's see what you guys think. Let's go ahead and bring in our first person, which is my favorite Bruin. What's up, Chris? How's it going? Good, man. Uh, you guys did well. Uh, defined well. <laughs> well okay. You guys had a very, very <laughs> sketchy start, but then uh, DTR looked great. You know, um, really classic DTR doing a lot with his feet. Yeah, I don't know if you want to go like game by game and – and how detailed you want to get, or if you're doing that later, if you want to talk more generally about the conference, but I'm happy to do either one. Sure. Absolutely. Again, this is, remember that the format of this show really is about, uh, Tony and I were sitting back and we were talking about the fact that, you know, there just is not a voice for us Pac-12 fans. And so uh, what this form really is, we're doing it in reverse. We were going to, Tony usually has, you know, he has a amazing graphics. Right. Start right. That's what I said. What I said. I don't know if you want to talk more generally now and then break it down as we like if if we're doing it backwards and we do that part later. That's all I'm asking. But I'm happy to talk about whatever you want to talk about. I can yeah, get into it. Yeah. Let's go ahead and if you want to go in, just your thoughts in general. How do you think the week went for the uh, the Pac-12? Then we can do the, that. Co the conference as a whole. I mean, Oregon Oregon got blown out, obviously, but that's against uh, literally the defending <laughs> the defending national champion, right? I know that they have, you know, every year is different, but that's it's not like they lost to some, you know, some middling team. And then you know, Utah looked like the better team in that game, I thought, for much of the game and lost on the road to a what people think is not a great Florida team, but they might be better than people thought. And you can't just go across the country and – you know, expect to win games all the time, no matter how good you think you are. And they're an interception in the red zone at the end of the game away from winning. And then the other, the other team that lost is Colorado, who is, you know, frankly, just not very good. And so, I mean, if you look at like what the Beavers did and what the Wildcats did. And if you think that the conference isn't, you know, is terrible because, because two teams went into SEC country and lost, the teams that are now ranked <laughs> like that's silly and i agree i mean one thing has been holding the pac-12 back for a while right it's been quarterback play i mean we have been the cradle of quarterbacks for ages you know and just but recently it's been a dry spell um and i'm really thinking with the quarterbacks we have now coming in um you know rising you know caleb williams mckee dtr cam ward you know these uh, Delora at uh, Delora at um, Arizona. These these guys are these are, these are quality quarterbacks that could start you know almost anywhere in the country. So I, I'm really happy uh, with that edge of it being sorted out. I'm still again really stinging from the uh, the Ute game. No more so than probably Larry. Larry, want to give your thoughts on what happened there? Oh, that Anthony Richardson is a lot faster in person than he looks on TV. And he's smooth, like, so I was 10th row. And so it, it's almost like just a perfect angle to see. You, you can just barely see over the players. And his transition, they ran read option. They weren't doing a lot of RPO. It was more read option. 
than RPO. And he's, he's pretty smooth, if that makes sense. And so they were getting us up the middle and we, we stopped that and he got us on the edge. But I just, when we went for that two point conversion, I said, don't go for it. Just take that extra point. And we would have won by one. We would have just ran to get a good spot for the kicker and kicked the field goal and got out of there. You know, if we if we would have took the four easy points, not went for it on fourth down, and took the you know the extra field goal, we they would have been trying to onside kick to to get you know to win that game. If you think about it, if we would have just took the easy points, yeah. So now, where, was, where a, was the ball? I, I can't I can't really remember. It was it was about the five yard line. Where was the ball? It was when, first and uh, first and goal from the six with twenty eight seconds. And that stadium went silent. It was like they knew they were going to lose because that offense, 28 seconds, three chances. You, I mean, how did you feel, Tim, when they got down to the six with like almost 30 seconds? You're like, oh, Utah's got this. Yeah, you, you give me that. Listen, if, you, if you'd have gone into that game yesterday, tell me, okay, tell you what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give Utah the ball, first and goal, 28 seconds. At the um, six. Yeah, and, and they're down, down three. Right, you take that, and of course you take that. Right, I mean, literally, Rising did the one thing he couldn't do. I mean, even if you guys a couple of tosses in, he throws that one away and give, takes another shot and misses that one. You, you kick the extra point. I mean, you, you kick the easy field goal, and you're going to overtime. I don't know how that overtime is going to work out, obviously, um, right? Because it really looked like the momentum had partially shifted. You know, what I mean, it did. It seemed to me like Utah was running that game, but then you know that fourth quarter. Yeah, they, they kind of – it just seemed like they were moving the, – especially on that last drive, it looked like Flores really moving the ball. So how yeah. that – how the extra time goes, but uh, but to watch that on second down, true. You know what I mean? Maybe I see him forcing on third down, forcing one in. But to force that throw on second down was just painful to see. Yeah, because we – I mean, we could have easily – if he would have thrown that out of bounds, you, you still got – what was it, 20 seconds? Oh, yeah. There, there was time for all your plays. There, yeah. there, was, there was time – I mean – Maybe Kyle, the way he was playing, he he might have tried to throw it all four, which I kind of get because, I mean, why would you go to overtime when you actually have the one play that you might actually have to win it in overtime? So in reality, really, you probably should try to throw it in on all four downs and not give them a chance to even put their offense on the field to put another point up. So, yeah, yeah, they should have – I. Cam knows better. He's a smart quarterback. That's actually what makes him one of the best QBs is, is that. But after the game was probably the worst part, like losing in a close one in, you know, in Gainesville, it, it hurt, but man, I'm telling you what, I, there was a few chat sessions I had been in and there were people saying, you better get ready to throw down. And I was like, yeah, our youths are going to, and they were like, no fan to fan. They're, they're not lying. I mean, they're in your face after you lose screaming obscenities in your face when you're not even, you're just walking. I mean, classless. It was, it was just classless. So. Yeah, you gotta remember those, you know, fan, the fans are going to be fans. And uh, I think it, that was, that was a hard fought game and, and oh, yeah. you guys deserve to walk away with that win. I mean, that the taste in my mouth after that game was the same taste I had uh, previously when I watched um, West Virginia find a way to lose that game on that interception. I mean, it was, it was that same feeling I had where the team that looked like they were controlling the game most, yeah. or if not the entire game and wasn't, was on their way to winning, just found a way to lose. And unfortunately I, you know, Larry, I think that's exactly what happened to Utah. Yeah. I think, I, I think that high insight, Utah is still as good as they were when they, when they left last year, you know what I mean? like end of the season, it's still, the team's still as good as they were, if that makes sense. So that gives you, that gives you hope. You're like, okay, it's not like we really fell down a notch. Our linebackers have got to get more experience. That showed up in the game. That's where they got us. But in, in all in all, it's, it's still a really, really good game. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and Utah season is certainly not over just because they lost that game. No, yeah. no. Actually, I, okay. I I left my hotel and it was almost, almost half time 
of the Oregon game. And I mean, I don't know how many Oregon fans we got on here, but I just went, I don't see Utah having any, it's almost like, like the championship game. It's like, it's the same Oregon and it's the same Utah team. If they were to play today, I think it, I, I mean, that's just me. Oregon's got some stuff to work out. To me, that hurt the conference. Utah losing hurt, but what, or getting smacked around like three points. They looked horrible in that game. Yeah, the, I think so, they've got a lot of issues on offense. Well, but you know, I guess if it's if any if it's any silver lining for you, it's, it's vindication of how you guys played. The fact that you know you guys only dropped to thirteen, and they placed you know correctly right in front of you, um, a Florida, Florida. team. Again, I think. See, here's the thing: yeah. a lot of people aren't giving. I, I think the problem was is a lot of people weren't giving Florida enough credit. But like you said, Anthony Richardson looks incredibly improved on this season to season. I saw a huge jump in his game. Oh yeah. And, and I, I think they, that, that their season is going to go a long, long way wherever he takes them. But yeah, yeah. Uh, if you guys want to talk about the the uh, Oregon game, we can move. We can pivot to that. The Tony, how you doing with your audio? Uh, I think so. Is it working now? Yes, perfect. Yeah, we're having to have some little adventures here, guys. Sorry, this uh, Streamyard site is absolutely just not working tonight. So it's been kind of an adventure. Well, I was lucky to pull in. I got, I got I grabbed Chris and uh, Larry real quick to uh, help us out and get started while you're trying to. Right. Say, so, guys, sorry about that for the delay, but yeah, keep talking about this game because this is, you know, certainly one of the big things we want to talk about. Yeah, no, we, we covered the Utah game in, in detail. Uh, I guess the second game we can't talk about if you guys like to, uh, Chris. What were your, did you were you able to watch the the Georgia uh, Oregon game again? If anyone's been on here or anyone in the late night chats in the uh, Discord, you know that I've been saying that I'm. I, I was really worried about that that Oregon game uh, from the go. I'm not. Everyone knows I'm not a Bo Nix fan. I didn't think they really upgraded themselves by going from Brown to Nix. Um, and one thing I was really kind of disappointed is was in just the overall that they look slow. I don't know what, but they just sideline to sideline. The Ducks look slow. They were able to. Georgia might also just be fast. Outside. What's that? Said Georgia might also just be really fast. George, well, okay, but Georgia really fast. But there's a lot of also there's a lot of other fast teams. There's fast teams in the Pac-12. I don't know. I don't know if anyone's seen you know our receivers, but it's it's not going to be any easier when they go to other teams. You know. I understand. I understand it's different dudes, but last year's Georgia defense was like the fastest thing I've ever seen on a football field. And I, I get it that it's a different team, and a lot of those guys are gone, but. Um, I don't know if we're – and to be completely honest, I have to be honest with you. I was at a hotel pool in Miami watching UCLA on my iPad, and Georgia, Oregon was on at the bar. But, you know, it wasn't my main draw of attention because, <laughs> unfortunately, Oregon didn't give me a reason to pay a lot of close attention. Uh, so I looked up and everywhere, but uh, I'm, not the, I'm not the best person to speak on that game specifically. Let's. Well, should we dive into this week? Let's do it. So yeah, later on, we guys will. If you want to call in and talk about your team, and you can brag about how they did, or you can, or you can also, you know, vent a little bit if you want to talk about this week. Um, but we'll be done a little bit later in the show. Go, go ahead, Tony. Yeah, and we want to chat. We want you guys to chat about the teams. We're gonna quick hit uh, each of the teams uh, in the Pac-12 because there's some interesting games coming up. But then we want you guys to chime in and chat about what you have going on. Um. Larry and Chris, you guys are welcome to stay. We're going to quick uh, just move you backstage really fast and chat about what we have going on. So, Tim, what a week we're about to have here in the Pac-12. Yeah, some great games coming up. I do I do like um, some of the teams that were playing cupcakes last week are really moving into some uh, difficult games. Uh, we still have some cupcakes on the menu for some Pac-12 teams, but um, – I'm excited. I'm only worried about two. I know we talked about earlier. There's two games I'm really worried about in general, but I feel confident for the rest of the games, the rest of the slate. Well, we kind of talked about it beforehand, and we kind of grouped them up, and there's about five Pac-12 teams we think are facing some easy wins. We've got uh, three teams that are involved in some big games, two teams that we think are some great unknowns, and two teams that might be likely disasters. So whichever one you guys fit in, we want to chat up with you guys about where you think that is. Uh, just a quick hit. We've got easy wins. We think we're going to see probably, you know, Oregon and Eastern Washington, Washington, Portland State, UCLA, Alabama State, 
Cal UNLV and Utah versus Southern Utah. Big games. We've got our first conference game uh, coming here, USC at Stanford. Then we've got a huge showdown of Oregon State and uh, Fresno State. Unknowns, Arizona, suddenly resurgent. Number eight, I think, on Mark Rogers' top uh, 25 that makes sense. We've got Arizona State and Oklahoma State, which is going to be a good one. And then uh, heaven knows what we're going to see. Washington State goes into Camp Randall to jump around, and Colorado faces Air Force. So it's going to be real interesting. Uh, Tim, should we hit our uh, our quick ones first? Sure. Let's do that. Let's take a look. All right, Tim. What do you think? We've got uh, at Autzen, Oregon and Eastern Washington. Is Oregon out for revenge? I think Oregon's going to be mad. I, I think everyone's got to, everyone forgot they went up against again they went up to, against the defending national champions. Uh, there's a lot of athletes on the, the Oregon team that weren't able to shine in that game. But I'm thinking against the competition, in Eastern Washington. I would not want to be the one of the Eastern Washington players this year. There's going to be some really angry linebackers for sure that are looking to uh, to erase the taste of their mouths that they uh, had last week. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's going to be uh, quite an interesting one and maybe pretty rough for Eastern Washington. Uh, next up to bat on our easier ones, Washington suddenly resurgent. They found an offense. They found a defense. They looked great last week. And now they've got Portland State at home on a game so kind of meaningless that it's not even on the Pac-12 network. It's on the Pac-12 network, Washington edition. So that'll be interesting. Tim, what's going to happen to Portland State when they go into Husky land, into the dog pound? Washington looked really good last week on both sides of the ball. Um, Asa Turner had two interceptions. You know, it was overshadowed by USC's interceptions. Um, then Penix, I mean, Penix threw for 350 yards, something like that. He's really hooking up with um, McMillan, a receiver. That he must have at least two or three touchdowns as well. I, I think this is going to be a snoozer. And Washington should win very easily. It is. And a special shout out, as Zach points out, Dubs is going to be back in the house. All right. Next up on the bat, uh, UCLA, Alabama State. Now, this is one that I think is is really interesting. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, this is actually a pretty historic game. Uh, this is actually the first time that an HBCU has ever gone into the Rose Bowl. And so it's a really, really neat opportunity um, for, for the whole HBCU community. For the black community in LA, it's going to be a big deal at the Rose Bowl. They're bringing out all of the majorettes and the bands and the cheerleaders and the dancers are all going to be there from Alabama State. So I, I don't know if the game's going to be any good, but guys, tune into the Pac-12 network if you can or stream it or steal it or whatever you have to do to watch because I think it's going to be a pretty cool show off the field. But Tim, what do you think is going to happen on the field as the Bruins take on the Hornets? I'm seeing a lot of Charbonnet, Charbonnet, Charbonnet. He's just going to run the ball. Um... You know, DTR was all we were talking um, previously with Chris about this. DTR is going to be DTR. He uh, he he looks fairly accurate. Uh, they got off to a slow start against. Um, um, sorry, I'm blanking out on the team. Uh, yeah, Bowling Green. It's Bowling easy to blank out. Oh, yeah, nobody those. saw it. Nobody saw it in person, and nobody saw it on TV. I did. I, actually, I only caught the highlights. I didn't even see the whole thing. But the, he, they started out slow, right? Some special teams gaffes, but they got rolling. And again, with athletes that they have, uh, DTR and Charbonnet, I, I really think, again, that they're just going to run the ball heavily and uh, should take care of this game easily. Now, last week, UCLA set a historic attendance record, Tim. Do you think, are they going to set another historic attendance record this week? Well, their they're, uh, student body, I believe, is still not in session, right? So. They're gonna. It's gonna. It's gonna be difficult. Uh, hopefully, it's not gonna be as warm. They're gonna get out there. But I do think again, the fact that you're gonna is historic for Alabama State being there with their wonderful band and everything. I'm hoping that's gonna bring some more fans out to the the Rose Bowl. I, I hope you're right because it is gonna be a historic game. But wow, guys, that was pretty brutal to watch UCLA break their all time lowest attendance record. But in all fairness, I mean, given the huge heat wave and the opponent of Bowling Green, I, if I, if I was in LA, I probably wouldn't have gone either. All right, next up to bat, we've got Cal, who struggled a little bit about against UC Davis before putting them away, uh, bringing host to UNLV, who has been pretty brutal. What's going to happen here at Memorial Stadium? Yeah, again, I just I think Cal, you know, Wilcox uh, this year, they, I, I don't know the name of the quarterback. Do you remember the quarterback transfer they got from the Big Ten? Uh, 
Can't hear you. Nick, is they, well, they, they were able to throw the ball. The big problem, you know, with with Cal has been their offense. They've always they always had a good defense, and I'm hoping that you know some fused quarterback play might actually help them. But you know, you don't be so bad again. This is on that stack of um, games that we just go ahead and put in the win column. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you're right. And it certainly better be if Cal has any hope of a good season. And then the Utes, who we talked about, uh, I think the doctor's coming to town to help them with a little bit of recovery in the form of Southern Utah, who's coming in to play them at Rice Eccles Stadium. Any any chance here, or is this going to be over pretty quickly? That's a quick W. I think so, too. Utah Utah's going to look to get some revenge and warm up for their other big games coming up. Now, the real big games. We got two big ones. Tim, first, you're my favorite. The Trojans and the Cardinal, and then what I think is really going to be the game of the day, the Beavers and the Bulldogs. Let's start off, Tim. USC, Stanford, we're going to be talking about this one a lot later with our callers, but what's your quick take on the Trojans heading up to the farm? My quick take is the fact that this is not the same Stanford we saw you know, earlier last decade. It, this is not a team that's going to beat you up on both sides of the line. Uh, matter of fact, I, I was kind of shocked when I saw this stat is, they were in the 120s in both um, in their rush offense and defense last year. I mean, really poor on the line play. So uh, the one thing I have going to this game, uh, sorry, this season with USC is, is how will USC's interior defense stand up against a good rush attack? Um, they do have a great running back in the fact that they have um, Emmett Smith's son, EJ Smith, as the running back. Kid had like a 95-yard touch or 85-yard touchdown run last week. Uh, he, he can get loose, but, um, their other two, the other two starting, um, tailbacks were transferred out. One of them, which was Austin Jones, who came to USC. I, anything can happen. I mean, if anyone's ever watched a USC versus Stanford game, this is our oldest rival that we have. Uh, anything's possible in it. And I will never, ever again say that I think USC is going to beat Stanford because I did that once literally almost promised it to my son. And well, they lost in one of the largest, or if not the largest, uh, upset of all time. So it was at the time it was the largest upset of all time. It's going to be a great game, but guys, we've got something special for you because we we just thought that we should have you know when we previously at USC Stanford we always have plenty of USC people, but we need something more. We need some Stanford folks. So on Friday we have something special coming for you. We are going to preview Stanford, but we're going to bring somebody from Stanford in to do it. So we thought, who do we want to get from the Stanford community? And guys, tell us in the chat, who should we have gotten? We, we thought, do we want the Google founders? Do we want the GM CEO? Do we want Christian McCaffrey, Chelsea Clinton, former Stanford player, Senator Cory Booker? Do we want Sandra Day O'Connor, Condoleezza Rice, Rachel Maddow? Who from the Stanford community should we have? Who do you guys think? Okay, well, I, I see you guys. Who else, who, else, who should we get? Okay, you're giving us Harbaugh. Harbaugh was good. Yeah. We, Dr. Sally Ride, we could have gotten Tiger Woods. We could have gotten Stanford's finest, convicted felon Elizabeth Holmes. We could have gotten uh, John Elway. Who, who should we get? Well, I'll tell you, we decided actually on a, a young entrepreneur, uh, Jordan Zietz uh, from Stanford. He helped found uh, Game Reef and then founded one of the largest esports leagues in the country for high school kids. And the reason that we're bringing on Jordan and he's coming here on Friday is because he's also the 44th Stanford tree. That's right. On Friday, we're going to bring you a special update for the tree, a pregame chat on Stanford and USC. So, guys, keep keep your eyes out. Set your notifications on the Boys of College Football's USC channel because we are going to have a special live pregame preview chat with himself, the 44th Stanford tree. It's going to be a lot of fun. Actually, the guy's totally awesome. If you guys don't follow him on, on Twitter, you should. It's Dust Stanford Tree, D-A Stanford Tree. Uh, absolutely hysterical. And I'll tell you, he, he was taunting us a little bit, telling us how much he misses Clay Helton. So uh, we'll see we'll see what he has to say on Friday. So keep your eyes peeled. All right, now on to uh, yeah, Go Tree or what? It, Gary, it could go either way. Uh, he's definitely a fun follow on Twitter, guys. Now, Tim. The big game I think is going to be awesome that I can't wait to see is Oregon State at Fresno State. The Jake Hayner touchdown club is going bananas. Guys, they say this may be the biggest game and the biggest crowd ever at Fresno State. As a lot of you guys know, Oregon State is completely rebuilding their stadium this year. It's only like 
18 or 20,000 seats or something like that. So they're actually traveling to Fresno and people are, are saying unquestionably with the standing room seats, it's going to be the biggest crowd to ever see a game in Fresno. Tim, can the bees do it? Yeah. I'm just shocked to hear a PAC 12 team going to Fresno state. That's something <laughs> new to me, but I think, I think that, huh? We're not used to that for sure. No, not used to that at all. Um, I, I really think that Jonathan Smith has it running out there. Um, He's he's shown in the last couple of years he's Billy something special up there in Corvallis. They've got a, a great offensive line, uh, and I really really do believe that they are um, are going to make some waves in the Pac-12 North. They 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 are actually right now, um, along with Washington, going to put some pressure on Oregon this year. I really do think uh, just with the talent and the coaching up there, it's going to be interesting to see an old Pac-12 coach and Jeff Tedford who was with uh, Cal for years. Uh, will be the coach for Fresno State. Um, I think Jay Kaner is a special talent. Uh, he showed UCLA last year. He's a gamer. And uh, this one could be a, a close one. I do think, though, in the end, that Oregon State's offensive line is going to take charge in this game and is going to power them to victory. I think you're right. Uh, I, I hope you're right. I think it's going to be quite a game. You know, I love all my V fans and friends. But I'll tell you, I really think that Fresno State is a good, good team. And I know they're cap- They're certainly capable of winning this game. Jake Hayner's awesome. Uh, it's going to be something, uh, something to see, guys. Definitely check that out. It's on CBS Sports Network, actually, uh, in that real late window. So it's going to be a lot of fun late at night. And if you're part of Mark Rogers' Patreon channel, we will all be hanging out and sort of watching it together. And we hope you'll join us. Fresno State's a great team. Now, a couple of great unknowns. And that's because we don't know what to think of these teams. These were two of the Pac-12's biggest dumpster fires the past few years. Arizona State, who couldn't Arizona State, who just has burned up everything imaginable, and Arizona, who has won what one game in two years. Uh, we both sort of figured, you know, are they going to be terrible? Are they going to be good? They've certainly done a lot to improve, and they both blew everybody out of the water last week. Arizona won a big game against San Diego State to spoil the opening of Snapdragon Stadium, and Arizona State, who we all kind of wondered what was going to happen when they played NAU just wiped them off the floor. So we got big games starting with first on the bat, Mississippi State at Arizona. It's going to be late night, Pac-12 on FS1, 11 p.m. kickoff. The SEC comes into the desert. Is Desert Swarm back or is it going to be more cowbell? Yeah, I I really wish um, this game had been played maybe a year from now um, because I do I do like I do like what Jed Fish has going on down there in Tucson. Uh, they uh, the biggest get for them in the offseason was was Jaden Delora, who's who's an amazing quarterback. Those of you guys familiar with the Pac-12 know him from up when he was up at Washington State. He's an amazing quarterback, and he has a great connection with, and I'm forgetting the guy's name, another transfer that just recently came in. He just lit it up last week. But then there's also the M- McMillan, and uh, who's, who's a great, big, tall receiver that I think is going to have a breakout year as well this year. Unfortunately, I just don't think they have the athletes uh, that are going to, especially in the trenches, to take on a team, um, an SEC team, even if it is Mississippi State. So, um, unfortunately, this is the one I think we may drop. It's certainly going to be an interesting one. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of it because I would have said earlier in the season that Arizona would just be, you know, demolished. But uh, who knows what we're going to see here? It's, it's going to, it's going to be something interesting. Thank Mississippi you. State- LBC, thank you. Yeah, it was Jacob Cowing, uh, Tony. That's what I was thinking of. The receiver oh, yeah, okay. that hooked up time and time again with uh, Delora last week. So let's hope he can keep hot. Yeah, we're, we're going to see what happens. And then, you know, this one, uh, again, if you'd asked me a couple weeks ago, I said it would have just been a rout. Uh, we've got Arizona State heading to Stillwater to take on Oklahoma State. Uh, now, this is uh, you know, some interesting realignment things here. You know, uh, some of the Big 12 homers keep hoping Arizona State will go to them. Uh, people talk about the fact that Oklahoma State has three times in the past dozen years tried to join the Pac-12. So who knows what's going to happen here. But Oklahoma State's number 11. They played Central Michigan and, you know, they controlled the game, but they gave up an obscene amount of points on the game. 60 something to 40 something. Not pretty. Uh, some really, really, really weak defense throughout the game from Oklahoma State, even though it wasn't really in doubt to a you know ho hum Central Michigan team. Can Arizona State do this? Can they can they extinguish the dumpster fire that Herm's been running? 
well, as much as a dumpster fire as it was last year and then the offseason into this year, uh, they had a great defense last year. They, I know they lost some players. Um, again, USC was recipient of one of their great linebackers, but overall, there still looks, appeared to be a very solid defense. You know they're going to be ready. Um, the, the, what I'm looking at is, you said Oklahoma State gave up a lot of points, and that right here, that's talking about Jim Knowles. Jim Knowles going to the other OSU. Oh, I did say the other OSU. Uh, the the <laughs> is really going to really um, can they stop uh, the offense? And I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting to see if if they can. But uh, their defense did not impress last week. Yeah, no, they they certainly did not. And so I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, to see what happens there. So leaving Stillwater, it's going to you know, be quite a game. Uh, you know, again, Arizona State, by the way, guys, some people ask about realignment questions. Arizona State, uh, who is run by President Michael Crow, one of the most influential figures in Arizona education, uh, he is about mis- the king of Mr. Pac- Pac-12. So, you know, I, I, the people that keep, you know, uttering nonsense, uh, they don't want to go anywhere. Uh, now we have to rock time. Emory Jones, I mean, I think Emory Jones will be the difference in this game. If he plays, he yeah. showed some flashes last week, and he's a great athlete. Um, if he can take advantage of that reeling uh, Cowboy defense, then that's going to be the key to that game. And I think, I'm hoping, that we could squeak out that one with a win. Uh, we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Tony, want, Tony, I think you're right. We may see a shootout alert going there. You know, we could, uh, we could, you guys, I think it's kind of exciting. The, de- the desert used to mean something. When you went into the Valley of the Sun, you went in and you faced the desert swarm down in Tucson. You know, those of you guys are a little older. Remember when that meant something, and so maybe it's going to mean something again. Uh, now let's talk about what might be uh, some rough times. So at Camp Randall Stadium, we've got you know kind of interesting, kind of a fun welcome. Two new CEOs. Uh, UCLA's law dean, uh, Chancellor Mnuchin, is now uh, the chancellor at UW, and then uh, Chancellor Chilton is now the new chancellor at uh, Washington State. So two really just Awesome ladies taking over, uh, both Pac-12 blood. So that's going to be, it's just kind of a fun little twist. We've got, you know, two of our, our Pac-10, our queens of college football from the Pac-12 facing as the Badgers go and try to see if Washington State can jump around. I don't know, Tim, what do you think? Is there going to be jumping by the Cougs or is it going to be kind of ugly? See, this is why we need someone um, in the commissioner's office, someone to say, okay, settle down Washington State. I mean, Washington State needed a an interception late in the game in the end zone in order to seal a victory against idaho so i'm not sure how confident i am going now they do have the the kid cam ward uh from incarnate word who transferred in it does has made that offense really exciting right and they brought his coach with him doing the offensive uh play calling It, it, it was fun to watch is that good? I mean, we're talking about a wisconsin team that maybe take a little bit step back on defense from last year but it's the this is not going to be Idaho, and unfortunately, I think this one might get ugly. Yeah, I mean, in their defense, Idaho, guys, for some of you guys who don't know that, is an old-school rival of Washington State. They're actually only 10 minutes apart. They're about eight miles or so apart, uh, both right there, each on either side of the state borders. They're actually closer together than USC and UCLA and much closer than Stanford and Cal. So they're, they're, that, was, that was a big old-school Pacific Coast Conference rivalry game we saw last week. But, yeah, Washington State is certainly looking up. But uh, I don't think they're looking up to the point that they're going to be able to do anything in Camp Randall. Zach, I think you're right. Badger's big. Now, Tim, uh, here is our here's our actual dumpster fire. Uh, I don't know if I've seen anything in the Pac-12 as bad as I saw Colorado just get whipped by what looked like a pretty awful TCU team last week. And they just came in and just pushed them all around Folsom Field. It was kind of a disgrace to the era of, you know, New Heisel and Jeremy Bloom and Gary Barnett and uh, Coach Mack and everybody else. So what is going to happen when they go to play Air Force? Because Air Force is pretty good. Yeah, a- along with, um, again, along with the Cougs, this one's going to be pretty ugly um, for different reasons. I, until until Colorado shows me that they can actually sustain a football a drive on offense, they can actually show me something, a pulse on offense, I, and unfortunately they're going to continue just to be um, – well, just on, on the losing side of games, then definitely even this one, this one's going to be kind of a, a one on the chin for the Pac-12, but I see uh, Air Force win this one in a laugher as well. Yeah, I I, uh, I I sadly think you're right. I think it'd be awesome awesome for Colorado, but 
uh, Air Force is probably going to be the Colorado State champions here this year because they got they got quite a team. So, guys, that is sort of a quick wrap up of what we've got coming this week in the Pac-12. Now, we want to hear from you guys. Tell us what it what do you think is going on? Uh, let's real quick. Let's put the um, uh, let's put the link here in the in the chat. Because we, we want you guys to uh, call in. Tell us. Fill us out. Oh, there you go. It's already there. Uh, if you guys want to hit that StreamYard link, we'd love to chat with you about what you think is going to go on the Pac-12. And if you're from a team facing the Pac-12 this week, give us a call. We want to chat. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you guys are thinking is going to happen here. All right. Shall we bring back? Uh, we've got uh, – we had TBM and Larry real quick. Uh, we want to hear your two teams' games this week. TBM, talk to us about talk to us about the Bruins. Sure, um, I don't think that what's going to happen this week is as interesting as what happened last week. But the uh, if you want to talk about Bama State real quick, yeah, I mean the it's a fifty point spread or something. What matters on the, <laughs> what happens on the field isn't going to be much of a contest, but. The uh, the USC people in this room will know this, and if Will's watching as a Notre Dame fan, he'll know this. There used to be a stat that uh, you know UCLA, USC, and Notre Dame were the only schools that had never played an FCS program. Um, I think it's a cool thing to be able to say, but I also th- I also think it's something that you know I think outside of those three fan bases, I don't know if anyone even knows that or cares, and. For us to do to lose that streak is, I think, an okay thing considering who we're playing. Um, I'm excited for an HBCU to come in and get that exposure. Uh, granted, there might not be a lot of people there again, but you know, be on TV. I'm hoping, you know, that they show. I actually looked up some videos on this. I'm hoping they show the the mighty the mighty marching hornets and the. Uh, and the Stingettes dancing on the field at halftime and, and how amazing that band is. Because you know, as college football fans, we talk about pageantry a lot, but I think that that is a chance to see a portion of some pageantry that doesn't often get the same kind of exposure that a lot of college football does. I think you're right. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be quite a game. Uh, Larry, talk to us about your boys. What do we think is going to happen? Um, they're probably going to get up by, I don't know, six, seven touchdowns first half, and then they're going to try to stick in all the backups, um, try to get those guys gelled. I know we got a couple of five, uh, borderline, you know, five-star linebackers. I know they're going to want to start getting them some reps. So I think they're just going to go up big and run the ball and get some reps. So, and, and kind of a, a chance to heal before the next week. Yeah, they're so Utah doesn't like to run up the score on their in-state FCS teams, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, San Diego State, I'm not worried about them. They hopefully they're not looking ahead to Arizona State and they take care of San Diego State. But this week's just a just a tune up. <laughs> cool. We'll take it. Yeah. All right. Um, Go ahead. I was going to say, I have a question sort of Tony and Tim for you about USC in comparison to UCLA and the the reactions um, to two games that I don't think are necessarily as (laughs) that different of what happened Um, last week. Um, But the reactions from the fan base and the media are entirely different. Um. And I think it's interesting to talk about why that is because so UCLA started off slow to like you were talking about before, right? You know, there's the interception where, where DTR never saw the guy. There was a muff punt return. There's a block punt for, for a TD where like, it looks absolutely awful. It, it ends up being only like a seven point lead at half, which is kind of what I said was going to happen last week. And I, and, or like said that might happen. And, yeah, you know, and everyone's wondering, you know, what the hell's wrong with UCLA? Uh, but at the later point, we end up scoring like 38. At the, at the end of the game, we score 38 unanswered. We have, you know, over 600 total yards. We only give up 37 yards rushing. 
So there are definitely like very, very bad things that happened early. But in terms of like having an offense that's humming and having a defense that showed up and did some some good things, granted against lesser competition and granted that we did that last year against Hawaii and LSU in terms of holding teams to ridiculously low rushing yard totals. I think it's uh-huh. funny because like the narrative after the week from UCLA fans is, oh, we're not that good. Here's all the bad things that we did, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the talk out of USC is, you know, for beating, we both, we, we both beat some really ranked teams, but the talk out of USC camp is like, oh, we're so excited for this year. Like everything's awesome. Like well, part, of it might be, <laughs> part of it might be, well, but I definitely, this is what it is, is USC was so piss poor last year. You know, you guys went eight and four, didn't you? Right. Correct. And so the, the, the turnaround, I mean, everyone's so damn hungry. It's, it is rice, but see when, when you wait on the entire off season after getting a coach, you know, the, the caliber of Lincoln Riley, getting just a slew of, of starters and freshman all American and Heisman hopefuls. I think it just might be that just the spotlights on USC a little bit more just because the media and the spotlight, well, in general, usually is. Uh, it all, yeah, it, all, it always is. And you're preseason ranked and we're not, I, I totally get that. I, th- I, I think, think it's more, I, I think it's more of like a issue of UCLA fan being overly pessimistic than it is well, yeah. about. Uh, I'll tell you another issue that I think actually played a big role in that quite honestly. And I know that this sounds silly, but like, the, cra- the lack of crowd at the Rose Bowl was so pathetic that it literally made USC, or excuse me, it literally made UCLA and the Pac-12 like the joke of the college football world this week. Like literally UCLA was the joke of the college football world. And when you add in the fact that they had such a really bad slow start, like if you had to flip those halves around, um, I don't think it would have been the same, but I think it's a double whammy of that. Like everyone's look ever in the middle of the afternoon, Everyone's looking at their their scores, and UCLA was losing to Bowling Green, and then immediately all over the college football world, the pictures went out of like five people in the Rose Bowl, <laughs> which I said was going to happen. <laughs> we, we 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 knew it was, and also by the way, because UCLA classes haven't started and it was terrible weather, and you know what, old people don't need to die of heat stroke, and the Rose Bowl is a giant like con, you know cauldron of you know convex heater concrete. Oh, I mean, is, it's, it's awful. Tony, kids, kids, yeah. kids on the field from Bowling Green. Kids from the field on Bowling Green, second half. Um, so there's like a joke in UCLA fan world about how Kelly talks so much about hydration and like body, uh-huh. and like taking care of himself. And we never had an issue. But in the second half of that game, when we had the ball, and no joke, I'm not exaggerating. Like every two plays, there was a kid on Bowling Green that went down, like cramping or like. Like the game stopped over and over because of how damn hot it was. People do not appreciate, and and I know all you get all the doofus like Texas Tech people are going to be like, "Well, in Lubbock it was Bob." Well, you know what? It truly it was awful in the Rose Bowl. By the way, all of your stadiums in most other places are designed for airflow. Like you look at the the spectacular, the beautiful stadium at Baylor is designed for shade and airflow. UCLA Stadium is a giant like walk of you know reflective sun radiation beam just to like overheat. And it just, it just is. And guys, you know, it's not that big a thing, but I think that, so I'm not, I don't begrudge the folks for not going, but I think the combination of those two really made them the butt of a bunch of jokes. Now that's very easily overcome by selling out the Rose bowl for your important games. Right. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm not like making a normative position of like saying that should have been one way or the other reaction wise after the fact, I just think it's like, it's interesting and kind of a knock on our fan base, to be honest, a little bit, even though, there's just there's just no enthusiasm for the program, and I don't think that there there will be unless we're five and zero going into our game against Utah. Now, do you yeah, think, and that, then people will care? And you, now, may be, you, you may be, you probably should be. Do you think that's a? Do you think that is because of the the Chip Kelly effect? I mean, he's turned off a lot of fans. He's definitely turned off a lot of the alumni and and boosters there. Do you think that he's wearing out his welcome? I I think yes. I in a way I think it's, I th- yeah I think there's not a lot done. Our, our I think our AD is great in trying to promote. I think it's a 
it's a non-conference schedule that people don't care about for a school that used to is used to playing you know big marquee games in non-conference and has fans that think that's what they should be doing regardless of whether it actually hurts your team on the field and yeah and you have a Kel- you have kelly who before last year had the worst run of any ucla head coach in ucla's history we go eight and four last year but we don't beat anyone with a better than 500 record um yeah there's just not a lot of enthusiasm around football um and and it's unfortunate. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's the scary thing. Is he's so Chip Kelly's on a four-game win streak. That's the largest win streak in Chip Kelly's uh, UCLA career. I mean, that 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 is that probably has a lot to do with the apathy. And to be fair, you guys did schedule Michigan, right? But they had to ba- they backed out for some reason. Is that right? Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. We appreciate it. Yeah, Wisconsin's going to be good this week. All right, guys. We've got a couple other folks. Um, let me move them in. Larry, hold on. I'm switching you to the, to the back room real quick. We've got Ben, from a big Michigan fan and a fan of all teams. Ben, what's going on? Tell us your hey, thoughts so- on the back 12 this week. All right. So here's my overreaction or possible reaction. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a big, big, uh, I'm a big 10 guy. And why am I over here on the Pac-12 channel talking to you folks? Because when I would put in um, major teams uh, to record for watching later, there wasn't last year wasn't a ton of Pac-12 games coming up, especially not USC. And now USC is popping up on my channel as a recorded game, and that's where my reaction is or overreaction maybe. And I know a lot of other Pac-12 fans are not going to want to hear it, but the eyes of the nation are turning towards USC. They are. Uh, everybody's wondering how this uh, how this uh, Stanford game is going to look. You guys got pretty much spanked by them last year. And oh, more than pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yo, you were you were spanked. Completely. So bad, so bad the coach got fired in week two. It was What's a coach that? firing quality win, is what it was. It was they were smacked so hard that they we finally got rid of uh, that guy that used to be our coach. Yeah. Well, now now having now having Lincoln Riley over there, everybody's looking at USC. And um, I have been, and I'm more interested in the Stanford game than I am most any other game coming on this. This, And I think a lot of Pac-12, and I hate to say this, I know Eric and Ben are either listening or going to be listening to this, and they're going to hate it, but I, I think in their heart of hearts, they know they have to worry about USC. And I think this game is going to be an important factor and they're telling us what we're going to look 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 at for the attention USC is going to get the rest of this year, the media attention. And, and I think it, 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 if they make a good showing here, it's just going to start the ball rolling. If so as we get ready for this game, Ben, I got to know what questions are you going to want to ask the Stanford tree on Saturday or Friday as we get ready to chat before the Saturday game? Oh boy. Um, let me think, let me think, let me think, let me think. Um, I, gonna have <laughs> I, I would want to ask him, how does he take losing? I want to ask him, how does he handle losing? Because I don't, I think, I honestly think USC is going to win it this time. I, I, But I'm not a Pac-12 guy, and I don't know the rivalry and how that goes, but I just have a feeling that Lincoln Riley is, I, I, I have, he's got my respect as a coach. And, so. and to, you guys in the, to you guys in the chat, tell us, what do you want to ask the Stanford tree? Tell it. Tell us what you guys want to hear because we, Tony, we're going to want to know. Go, Tibia. Yeah, Tony, while you're collecting quotes for the Stanford tree, I'll, I'll give you a bit of uh, filler here while we let, and then you can run through them. But the, uh, if I'm not as high on, on SC as SC fans are for what they did with Rice, I'm, I don't think we know anything yet. But if USC fan, if USC is half as good as, they, as USC fans think they are after that game, <laughs> then they should be beating Stanford by, like, three touchdowns. Stanford is not good. <laughs> yeah, it's open. Right. Here's open. Well, I'm going to let you guys go with that note. I just wanted to get you guys as – I know you – Tony, I don't know where you are. I know where Tim is, but where are you on? Do you th- on this? Do you think USC is back? USC is never not back. 
<laughs> That's my stance. No, uh, <laughs> okay. we, we, had a, we had a real rough time. Uh, you had to prove it on the field. I know. And and it and it was you know it, and it wasn't really his fault because he's actually a pretty good coach. Um, <laughs> but it was a it was a, a can't win situation where we started circling the drain. And in today's social media and you know constant twenty four hour news cycle world with college football, once you start circling the drain, you gotta flush it. Uh, no, I mean it's true. It, teams once once the drain starts circling in college football today. I, I hate to say this, but I think I think you got I think you got to flush it. And you know we finally did, but we had to build up the program in the meantime, and we did, and, and we're getting to see see the fruits of those rewards. So I think that that's pretty exciting. Well, I'm and, excited. I can't wait to watch that game, guys. I'll, I'll it'll be great. I'll be uh, I'll be uh, I'll be a Big Ten guy watching the Pac-12 game this weekend. Thanks for joining us. All right, Thanks. catch you later. The to clear up, Ben. Though here's one thing: I didn't say USC was back. <laughs> let's not let's not let's not strip things together. I'm saying that USC is back to competing in the Pac-12. That's for sure. We weren't competing in the Pac-12. I think USC is a couple of recruiting classes away of being able to call themselves mm-hmm. contending for a playoff and, or a national championship. So that's the next step. First step is win your conference. I think we're well on the way to doing that. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And that's and that's what I meant. You know, we we we're, we're on that ascendancy of getting back where we need to get. Um, all right, Ben, thanks for joining us. Uh, why don't we bring in uh, Michael? And uh, we'll put the, we'll put the, the um, stream out in the chat, guys. We'd love to have you call in. Call in and chat about what you think is going on in the Pac-12. Michael, talk to us. All right. A couple of games. I'm looking forward to the Washington game. I'm also looking forward to the Arizona um, State, the Arizona State game and the Arizona game. Those are the three games I'm looking at. What do you think is going to happen with Arizona State? Uh, I think it will be a, kind of a shootout, but I'm wondering, do they got? I mean, does do they got enough to stop Oklahoma State though? Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be tough. Right. And you know, some of the guys put it out in the chat. You know, Central Michigan scored a lot of points. It wasn't necessarily against the first team, but then again, Arizona State's a lot better than Central Michigan. Mm, now with the Arizona game, I'm I'm really looking to see what um, Cowan can do and stuff like that because it looked like he had the if he had an easy time with um, San Diego State last week. What can he do with Mississippi State? Yeah, it's going to be real interesting. Mississippi State, uh, are they going to bring the cowbells? What do you think? Uh, I think they'll bring the cowbells. And as far as that's the dream, my question. Cowbells in the desert. I, yep. I wonder if he's going to get into the fight with Cal's mascot this year, like they, like the dream Cal's mascot did back in the 90s. They, that's, a that. question. Oh, that's a good question for the tree. That's a good question. Not bad. So, what time are you guys going to bring him on? Um, right. we're actually. It's probably going to be uh, kind of early evening. Uh, you know, kind of maybe mid evening in the on the East Coast, uh, early evening Why? on the West Coast. After he's got I class, mean, he's, after he's doing class. He could have class at seven thirty on a Friday night. Uh, I mean, just class for various stuff. Um. Okay. I was wondering. Can I? Can I wait for that and stuff like that? So. But he is an interesting follow on Twitter, and I recommend you guys follow him. He is. He's so great. Does Stanford what are you looking forward to? What am I looking forward to? Tony? Yeah, which games? Um, I'm, uh, most of them. Uh, I'm really looking forward to USC Stanford because I think it's something that we've been, we've been waiting a long time. This is where we get to see if USC has got it got it back together. Uh, you know, sort of the next one. I think that this miss just like you were saying, Michael. I think that this Mississippi State Arizona game is going to be real interesting. Um, and I'll tell you guys, I'm looking forward to seeing. I, I don't know if I'm going to care at all what's happening on the field, but I think the historic significance of Alabama State and um, you know the, the Stingats and the and the Marching Hornets coming into the Rose Bowl when when those guys march through the tunnel, I, I hope that it's on TV because it's pretty historic and it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, yeah. Like TBM mentioned, UCLA is is losing that status that they've always had. Of being the only, the or being one of three teams to never have played in an F, uh, FCS team, and they're losing it this year, and Notre Dame's losing it next year. But they're both losing it because they're playing uh, HBCUs, and and I think you know same thing as going to Rose Bowl. The first time we bring an HBCU into Notre Dame Stadium, that's going to be really cool. Um, yeah. But but also to be clear, UCLA. I don't, and, and some of you guys may not know this. US UCLA has actually they have such a rich history uh, of diversity. UCLA has arguably done more for integration than any of the HBCUs. 
Uh, you know, yeah. oh, Jack Robinson was a legendary Bruin. Arthur Ashe. Arthur, I was going to say, Arthur Ashe is a pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah, Arthur Ashe is a real big deal, especially this week of all weeks. Uh, you know, Rayford Johnson was president of the UCLA student body while he was like sportsman of the year, you know, winning Olympic gold medals. I mean, UCLA has, has always done amazing things. Uh, oh, now, the Cal. Especially with Jackie Chan Robinson, too. Exactly. I'll, I'll tell you something actually kind of funny. The Cal Chancellor says that um, in, in the 20s and 30s, when UCLA was trying to build up the program, part of the reason they were so strong in the black community is because when they were paying their players through the black churches, they knew that they wouldn't rat them out to the NCAA. Uh, so there, there's some funny memos on that from the uh, to the president of the University of California that are now sort of unsecret and sealed as they were figuring out how UCLA was paying their players. It was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. uh, that was back, back when NIL was uh, you know not so talked about. So we're going to see what happens. Now, is Penny, I don't know, how did um, Plummer do last week for Cal and can Penny back it up last week, this week with his performance he had last week? Thanks, Gary. Yeah, Penix. Oh, I, Tim, I, tell, tell me what you think. I think Penix looked great. I think Kalen, Kalen DeBoer, you know, Washington had talent, and Kalen DeBoer came in, fixed up the program. That's what the guys on the team were talking about. The, the players on the team gave him the game ball last week. It was actually, there's a pretty cool video of it. One of the team captains kind of in tears saying, this is my sixth year, and, you know, thank you for everything. You've done it for us, coach. And, again, Kalen DeBoer is a guy who's done nothing but win at every level at, of Washington. And, he got hired about two days after Lincoln Riley, so nobody was paying any attention. But he's done nothing but win at every level. And, Tim, I think he starts to bring Huskies back. Yeah. Doing it right. Penix was chucking the ball, man. He was throwing it all over the place. He, yeah, like I think I said earlier, he's roughly 350 yards passing. What did you um, on the ground rushing? Pardon? What did you on the ground running? Because uh, I know he'll also run, too. Yeah, he's a big he's a big athlete. Dude, he – Um, I didn't – I didn't – I couldn't see the whole game, so I don't I don't know how he did overall. I just was able to see. They do a really cool thing where they do like in the the highlights of the games on the on the Pac-12 um, network. So oh. I was looking at the highlights. And most of the highlights they weren't really running highlights, but he's just making all the throws in the flat, you know, over the middle, and he had a couple of beautiful deep balls. So um, oh. I think that again, I think that the boar is going to make some waves. I I think that this year is going to be a dogfight for the the Pac-12 North between. Oh. Uh, between Oregon State, Oregon, and Washington, I really think that's going to be a hell of a run up there. Now, I know yeah. obviously that it won't matter. It's not going to matter. Yes, that they're not doing the North and South when it comes to the um, the actual Divisions. championship game. But the the scheduling is set up traditionally with the North and the South. And I think when all when all is said and done, I do think that um, it may not be Oregon with the best record up there. Yep. All right. I'm going to ask you this, but I will say this about Penix. There is times he'll be erratic and will throw picks and stuff like that. From what he used to do, the same thing in Indiana. My last thing before I go, Tim, are you feeling better? Or are you still under the under the um, bug? I'm I'm feeling much better. Um, technically, I am COVID free, uh, but I still have this stupid lingering cough, and uh, just again, once in a while, for no random reason, I've had a little bit of. Uh, just getting tired in the afternoon, which is not normal for me. But overall, I'm I'm very pleased and grateful that I came through this thing with very little hiccups. You know, so yeah, thank you very much, Michael. You're welcome, and Tony. The next time you're late, you owe everybody a twenty dollar gift card from Amazon. What? Oh yeah. Said, the next time, like, all yeah. right, guys, take yeah. care. See you guys Friday. Next time my computer decides to do what it it is doing right now, I'm going to be lucky if I don't throw it against the refrigerator. Uh, to answer Michael's oh, question I wanted, real quick, I wanted to do last week. Do what? What, Michael? I'm sorry. I thought um, what's his name was one to ask me a question. No, I was going to answer your question. I think you asked about Plummer also and what Cal looked yeah. like, and yeah, um, especially early, it looked like a lot more of the same. Unfortunately for Cal's offense, uh, I think they went like started the first four drives with either like a three and out or an interception and Plummer did not look that great. I think they figured it out and moved the ball later on. Um, so maybe they figure it out and it's, you know, first guys, first new year, new, uh, new offense and whatnot. If we want to try to make some excuses, but unfortunately for Cal, it looked like a bit more of the same on that side of the ball. All right. And, and to answer, Gary, to answer Gary Lewis's question. 
Gary, I assume those leads you're talking about are named after famous Arizona State legend Frank Cush. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what else you're talking about. Uh, obviously, you know Frank Cush is a a legend, and and I guess he might have some some leads named after him of some kind. I'm sure that's what they are. Michael, right, thank guys, you for joining. Care. us. Hey guys, take it easy. Hey Nick, could you turn on your camera really quick just to make sure you're a human being for us? I mean, we, we won't. You don't have to put it on when we're when we bring you on here. You can turn it back up. I just want if you have your camera real quick. All right, thanks, oh, hey, Nick. Nick. All right, we'll add we'll add you real quick. Nick, welcome. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Tell us what do you think about the Pac-12 this week? Um, as far as uh, specific games, I mean, I'm more of a Big Ten fan, so I haven't looked at the. I guess I really haven't looked at. Uh, the college football schedule coming up uh, this weekend uh, for big games just across the board. But I guess I just wanted to kind of get your guys' opinion on USC and UCLA joining the Big Ten. And do you think um, – I mean, I guess what do you generally think of that? And do you think the Big Ten expansion model – would fit more teams from the Pac-12 potentially joining? Because I don't think it's – I know a lot of people are hating on it. Like, it's kind of a negative thing. But I actually think it could be a positive thing, like kind of more of a merger, um, especially if they're looking to add more teams. So so I'll, I'll tell you, um, I, I kind of look – there's kind of like two pieces I look at this in. Um, the first one is sort of like the strategic uh, end of it. And then the second one is the financial end of it. Um, so on the strategic end of it, I think you're absolutely right. I actually had done up a presentation about a, over a year ago before Texas and Oklahoma left, actually, that advocated that uh, 10 of the Pac-12 teams really should partner with the Big Tw the Big 10 in a, a truly like some form of a merger. Uh, I, I, I really think that the institutions have a lot to gain together. Um, Nick, you, you probably know that the Big 10 is about way more than sports. It's about integration of all sorts of elements of the academic and the business and the research sides of the university. And the Pac-12 teams and the Big Ten teams have always been very culturally in lockstep with each other in a lot of ways. And so I, I think that actually almost all of the Pac-12 teams strategically would would fit in in, in the Big Ten. Um, however, financially, well, they the AAU thing, you know, exactly. that stamp of approval. Exactly. It's the AAU thing. And even, even schools like Arizona State, I mean, heck, even Washington State and, and Oregon State are really good schools. There are no crummy schools in the Pac-12. Um, you know, the, even the, the ag schools get, you know, a little bit of a, they get kind of a little bit of a bad rap because their admissions are a little more flexible. But, like, they do some, like, serious world-class stuff at both of those schools. Like, and we like to tease them, but, like, they really do. I mean, you know, e equal to or better than a lot of the stuff, like, even at a school like Nebraska. So, uh, you know, again, all of those schools, Arizona State is, you know, they're, they, they've they always sort of been dinged a little bit by like the AAU and like their admissions and stuff. But Arizona State is also a world class school. It's a great school. Um, and and well, so in, in that regard, they're, they would really fit. The hard thing is, you know, you think about like, every, you know, the Big, Tw the Big Ten right now is sort of, you know, split into a pizza pie. You know, who makes the pie big enough that another, that adding another slice? actually makes each slice bigger. Uh, USC and UCLA did that. There's a lot of question as to who else does that, and that's the hard thing. So, you know, I think hypothetically, if we were, you know, North rearranging, West. yeah, if, if we were rearranging building blocks, uh, who could, you know, may, maybe Washington. I mean, I honestly think, though, that because of the Big Ten is about so much more than sports, you know, the Cal, Stanford, Washington, they would really add a lot. Um but Do you think the, the Big Ten could be the structure for the new pod system? So, like, regional pod systems. So, like, with the UC, uh, UCLA and USC, that's obviously a similar location. So, you're going southwest. What about the northwest? And then you could potentially try to pick off some ACC teams. I mean, if you're just trying to go by region. If you well, there, there's a lot of people that point out, you know, and, I, and I've actually done some talks with Mark on this on his Florida State and Miami channels that Miami and Florida State would would be very good fits for the Big Ten as well. Now, the ACC grant of rights is not going anywhere legally, probably. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. And, and the latest word that we're hearing from Big Ten sources is, you know, whatever, whatever that's worth. But, you know, not the, not the nitwits, but the you know actual things like we're getting, like the stuff from the president and athletic director of Idaho, 
or excuse me, in Iowa, not Idaho, the stuff we've heard out of Ohio State is, is that right now the Big Ten seems to be staying pretty much pat. So I think we'll, we'll see probably the, the Pac-12 will have like, you know, a five or six year grant of rights or something. The Pac-12 will certainly con- continue to thrive and see what happens going forward. You know, you, you, with a playoff structure uh, that might or might not continue, you know, you, may, you might see something more of, I, I, we hate to use the word alliance because it sort of is a bad word right now. <laughs> But you might see a, a more a more of a, a partnership as wounds heal a little bit, yeah. um, because the thing is, like I said, the ACC and the the Pac-12 and the Big Ten are really culturally aligned on their institutions and values. They're about being a university, and I yeah. know that, like that is literally makes certain minds at you know like schools that play in Farmageddon like explode at the thought of the fact that a university is about being a university. College football is based on colleges uh, because and we, we joke a lot of times in the Big Ten, we say the B stands for billions and everyone yeah. else is playing in their millions. And, and that's just something that I think doesn't get enough credit. But a lot of that funding, too, I mean, I, I, I don't know how from the academic standpoint, that AAU stamp is a huge, huge, huge thing from funding and the academic side really – um, I mean, the, the only school in the Big Ten, take away USC and UCLA, the only school in the Big Ten currently that doesn't have the AAU stamp is Nebraska. And they did when they originally joined. Yeah. But because their, you know, medical center was off campus, they got booted out. And they, they, had a couple, um, they had a couple other issues. Um, yeah. Wait, wait. This, this is a great conversation, but this is a Pac-12 yeah. show. And Sorry. We're kind of- I count the I, Big Ten as 12. I really do. Thank, thank you, Tim. Did you're right. Twelve. What? Uh, Nick, did you have a question about the Pac-12 or any, any games coming up? No, I guess I just uh, – one last comment. I can let you go back to it. Um, I, I really love the Rose Bowl, so I would love uh, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 to, to figure out some kind of merger, and we could – keep that thing going alive that that rose bowl is special and i don't want to see it go down so thanks guys nick i, nick, I think you're totally right and uh i'm also proud that uh the rose bowl has now been the big 10 championship 47 times as usc and ucla move in there all right and guys nick, let's- nick loved your thoughts and everything remember we also do uh here on mark's channel on sunday nights we do a an after dark ben hosts a really fun show and we um we'd love to hear you call in on that and we'd Love to discuss that with you then. Yeah, Nick, you should come come join us on Sunday. Sorry, sorry, Nick. I'm getting scolded by Tim. Correct, correctly so for straying into Big Ten land. Uh, J Dub, welcome. Good evening, gentlemen. I am pleased to take the conversation away from realignment. Please do. Had, yes, I had uh, had quite enough of that. Uh, I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, three blocks from where President Lincoln is buried. I went to school at the University of Alabama, got my Bachelor of Science in Communications in 1989, went to work for the Associated Press in Des Moines, Iowa in 1990. And in my entire life, I've given not one rip about West Coast sports. <laughs> well, we're glad I, to have I, you on the I, I never root. I, I never root for anything west of the Rockies. I don't care what the sport is. I don't care what's going on, unless it's somebody who's competing for the United States in the Olympics. But that said, I want to tip the hat to both Tony and Tim because following you guys in this Mark Rogers stream and in these shows has made the Pac-12 interesting for me. For the first time in my life, I for the first time in my life, I'm kind of curious about what goes on out there instead of ignoring it until January 1st. So I, I, I guess what the larger message is kudos to you guys for turning an old, an, an old curmudgeon into somebody who will at least open his ears. And also that's one of the great things about college football, uh, that there can be interest across the board. I know a lot of people, uh, a lot of my family, a lot of my friends who are Bears fans, and they and, and they're in they're NFL fans, they're Bears fans, and they don't care anything about anybody else. 
They don't know anything about anybody else. They don't want to hear anything about anybody else. They don't want to read anything about anybody else. It's just about the bears, you know? And it's like, you got to at least, you know, know what's going on around the rest of the country. And I gave that about a bunch of lip service this whole time, ignoring the ACC and the, and the PAC. Well, well, just between all of us, I'm still ignoring the ACC, but <laughs> that's okay. I, uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know what? I can't help that. I can't help it. Uh, they, when I think of the ACC, I, I know this is not a direct connection. I keep thinking of Beano Cook and the late in the 70s and the 80s and East Coast football when it was a bunch of small independent schools and all they did was play each other and they were nobodies and they beat up each other and then they got into a bowl game and they got humiliated. And it was just not, it was not good football. And it's still not good football. But there's been, there's been good football out on the West Coast. Uh, and I agree with Tony. This I hope people get a chance to see some of this UCLA-Alabama State game. Uh, if you go onto YouTube uh, and you look up bands and you look up Alabama State, Alabama A&M, Southern, Grambling, some of these HBCU bands, uh, Florida a and Florida A&M, you are in for a show. It's going to be really cool. JW, by the way, a couple quick laughs. Uh, BW says, you're now West Coast curious, and he likes it. Uh, <laughs> Chris, Chris, Chris gives us perhaps the biggest compliment we've ever gotten. The fact that we got one person from SEC country to maybe watch a Pac-12 game means the show has done God's work. Oh, I've watched Pac-12 games. In fact, my question for the Stanford tree is, is, is how does he stay mobile on the sidelines with that much wood? <laughs> Yo, you should definitely call and ask him. He will have a good answer for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I do have to say I was... Um, on Instagram, he uh, looks like he's pretty popular anyway. So I think uh, he'll have a good answer. I do have to say, when I saw that ball, was a ball state UCLA? When uh -huh. I saw the, when I saw, I, I don't want to say, a, I don't want to say the crowd. I was say, when I saw the people who had gathered, <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, rather shocking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. they, were, they would have had, they would have had a much larger crowd in Muncie. They, they, they said they sadly would have, but uh, it should be, it should be a good one. Well, thanks, JW. That you are definitely our nicest caller of the day. We appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to call in and let you know that I, I've been listening and I will continue to listen. And and uh, uh, good job and 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 best of luck to your teams. As always, as long as they don't play Bama, I don't. I'm happy to root for anybody's team. Let let them win as long as they're not playing Bama. Hey, thanks. Yeah, we're, we're gonna try not to play Bama for a little bit until we're ready. Until okay, we're ready. All right. We'll see hey, you guys. Hey, 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 last Come thing real quick. I, I thought I I thought a little I thought thought I'd drop this in real fast. I know it's packed well. Drop unbelievable. The unbelievable the million dollar band, Alabama's band, is not going to the game in Austin. I have not been able to figure out why, but they're not going. I've but two it theories. has been it has been confirmed, however, that the football team from Alabama will be eating dinner Saturday night at the Longhorn Steakhouse. <laughs> uh, you know, JW, I have a question. You might know the answer to this. Um, I saw the reason they're not going is ostensibly because UT is going to put them in the upper deck. Um, I've also seen reports that Alabama has chosen or essentially didn't chose to put like their donors in the better seat and the band in the upper deck, um, which is a question. And I've also seen people questioning whether the band is really trying to save some money and get out of the deal. So, uh, well, I'm sure there's, I'm sure money is involved. There's, I mean, it's clearly a money thing. It's just, or, or, maybe, or, or maybe they just think their services really aren't needed. Well, they, they might not be, but, uh, I, <laughs> I hope, I, I hope, uh, that this doesn't, and, and believe me, because with, in the big 12, I, I've dealt with Texas for a long, long time. Uh, they might just have the ugliest band uniforms in the country, in my opinion. Oh, so uh, not... if, if if they don't go to BDS next year, nobody in Tuscaloosa is going to miss them. All right. 
We'll see. It's going to be a good one. Hey, thanks for coming, calling in. All right, thank, thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Come welcome. Jeffrey. Hi, how you doing? I, I got to ask you a few questions. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Big Ten guy and SEC and all that on the East Coast, uh, but – Hey, I'm, just Jeffrey, gonna, you're, you're, Jeffrey, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm a big fan of yours. I saw you on Mark Rogers the other day, and I think you're coming for everybody's job. So I'm a bit you nervous having you here. Go, go oh, ahead. Thank man. you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't, I don't think I'm that good. I'm actually getting really nervous when I'm on here, but I just, I just like talking college football. You guys do a great job. Mark does a great job, and I love coming on here. But, uh, but thank you. But I want to ask you and your opinion, since y'all are Pac-12 guys, what happened to Stanford? What happened to Stanford? Why did they fall apart? I've, I've had that some theories on that. I think that for a while, they, for a while there, um, Stanford was getting, well, Stanford still does. Because when you think who's usually the smartest guy in the football field, people don't realize that it's usually not even the quarterback. It's usually the offensive lineman. Those guys are smart. And, Stanford was stockpiling the best West coast linemen and, and from all over the place for years. And it just seems like for, uh, I think part of it had to do with Oregon's had a great run of getting offensive linemen. So that's a part of it. Um, but I just don't know. Cause I do have all respect to the world for David Shaw. I, well, at least I, I did. Um, I didn't think he does a great job, but for some reason, they're just not getting that premier running back, that great quarterback and that, you know, unbeatable, front seven and, and, uh, offensive line. I don't know where the recruiting's going, but that's, that's, you want my short answer is recruiting. They're not recruiting the guys they used to. Yeah, I agree with that a hundred percent on the recruiting, but all I know is when I was younger, uh, that Stanford was like elite and it's just kind of sad to see them struggling. Uh, another question I got, do you think if you oh, hold on, hold on, real, quick, real quick before you ask that, mm -hmm. uh, we hope that you'll join us on Friday because the better person to answer that question is the 44th Stanford tree. Tony, I can add a little bit to that too. If you like the, uh, for okay. Stanford, especially in the world of the transfer portal, uh, that's a one way thing for Stanford because, because people, a lot of schools like to talk about like their academic requirements of getting football kids in, you know, like Notre Dame likes to talk about it. UCLA likes to talk about it. Yeah. You know. Uh, other other schools like to talk about it but for Stanford it's really really true and they can't get grad transfers or uh, transfers from other schools university wise in the same way like any of these other schools can so the transfer portal being you know like a free for all kind of thing free agency if you will so to speak is is that another aspect of it in addition to what Tim already said is the fact that that's a one way street for Stanford and but they're now, not going to bring in the same kind of people that they're that they're, they're losing. Chris, would you agree though that's always been the case with Stanford and when you're a grad when you go to grad school you'd be a grad transfer that the one time rule really hasn't affected that either, you know. Like with Stanford that's that's been a standing thing with Stanford's getting kids in admissions wise as well as um you know, if there's not many Andrew Lux out there, right? That are brilliant minds and also like NFL quality quarterbacks, you know, and, and then, and then McCaffrey was a, was a legacy. Someone said that, that it was Harbaugh left and they fell apart. They didn't. David Shaw had that stuff roll in the beginning. He was cranking at the beginning of the decade. So, I mean, it, it didn't. And that that's the, that's the weirdest part. I think what Scott Jeffrey asking the question is, is he had it rolling. It was, and it wasn't like a hell It wasn't a one year deal. He had it going for a while. And then all of a sudden, again, the, the I mean, literally I, this was the answer up here too. Um, we played, uh, I lost it. You moved, oh yeah. Um, Mike Bloomgren, right. We just played them at rice and he was a big part when he left. That's, you know, maybe I'm missing, maybe I thought a little too simply, but that's it. You're just losing a guy like him is going to uh, definitely affect offensive line recruiting. And for all the great, again, Andrew Lux and Loves and, and McCaffrey's, I think about when I think about those great runs that Stanford had, I, I just I just remember those offensive lines just being freaking brutal. You know, these two tight end sets on in the goal line. It's like, dude, just hand them six points. These guys are going to score, you know, and that's just not there anymore. And, 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 and Tim, I think is really right. I mean, so remember you guys with COVID and stuff, you know, everybody got extra years added on now graduate transfers are all the rage. 
And the problem is, like, even some of Stanford's own kids can't get into their own grad school. And and it's just it's a real it's a real issue. Um, and and I, I don't know if you know this, Jeffrey, Stanford in the 1950s, when, when USC and UCLA did exactly what USC and UCLA are doing right now, um, Stanford and Cal tried to join the Ivy League and the Ivy League told them no. They, they 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 really were like okay we don't even know if we can do this anymore and 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 looked to actually get out the Ivy League told them no and so then they actually went and created the pack the what today is the Pac twelve because uh, they they were in in such a mess so you know Stanford has always kind of been on a, on a real different level in this era of transfer students uh, and transfer quarterback just it isn't it doesn't always work and, I, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be real stereotypical and this does not apply to everybody guys certainly. But, you know, there's a lot of the football players at a lot of schools that are taking, like, crap classes and not doing great. And if you're taking crap classes and you're not doing great, you're not going to get into Stanford as a transfer. Mm-hmm. You're just not. Or, or in, in any way. And, and so Stanford is the number one school in all of FBS academically. And it is no joke. And you guys are going to see, by the way, when you guys meet the Stanford tree, like, people from Stanford are kind of awesome. When you, when you see their – when you meet their ba- – when you see their band and you see their fans, like, there's really no more punchable fan base imaginable. But then when you meet their actual individual people, they're all friggin' awesome. And, and, and it's just, it's a really, really a neat place. It's really cool people. Again, they're banned, burn them at the stake, but uh, their, their kids are really awesome. Well, yeah, like I said, um, you know, watching Stanford, but last year it was just so frustrating. Uh, they beat Oregon and then they beat USC, and then they lost all those bad teams. It was just, it was just unbelievable. But, uh, the, but yeah, that's real interesting. Thanks, I didn't know on the Ivy League. But the other thing I was going to ask, uh, do you think if Utah runs the table and wins out that, uh, and wins the Pac- Pac-12 championship game, Absolutely. can they make the playoff? I would think yes, mm. because they, okay. Well, there's, there's, there's a couple caveats to that one. Florida can't go, can't start losing. If Florida wins seven, mm-hmm. eight, nine games, you know, they, you have to factor in the fact that they, they traveled across the country to play in the swamp, lost on an interception at the end of the game. I mean, you know, that, that, that factors in for that loss. Also, they're going to need to rely on USC and, and Oregon um, playing very well mm-hmm. because they're going to need, you know, some really quality wins. And let's just assume this, this is assuming uh, under my scenario that they can make it, you're looking at USC and Oregon both have to be ranked teams, you know, probably like 10 and two, nine and three type teams. And they got to win convincingly over those. So you got to figure they're probably going to play um, Oregon or USC twice, right. Uh, um, during the regular season. And then on the, when they meet them in the, in the championship game. So under all those situations, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? No, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's another thing, Jeffrey, um, and for those SEC fans, there's the thing my friend Chris likes to call the Phil Fulmer school of losing from when Phil Fulmer was the coach of Tennessee. And that is that if you lose early, you can pretend it didn't happen by the end of the season. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if Utah were to run the table, uh, you know, they, they certainly could do it. But I'll tell you, Jeffrey, one of the weird things about the Pac-12, it's such a fun, like wacky cultural conference. But one of the most bizarre things, and it just, you know, it like drives us crazy every year is that every game is a trap game. So wait, who do you cheer for in the Big Ten? Uh, Indiana. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're a Hoosier, so you kind of understand this. Like Purdue, Iowa, like Illinois, like the, they can have some terrible teams. They can have mm-hmm. some general terrible teams, and great teams will go in there and lose. Mm-hmm. And every Pac-12 game is like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe not. Oh, I love Arizona. watching them too. My my mom can't stand when I stay up for them, but I love watching them. Going to bed at one thirty, she's so mad. But man, they're great. Yeah, they have they're like great. that Washington they're State game last year, and they were against uh, I think it was Oregon or two years ago, and it was like sixty fifty five. It was crazy. Their wacky things happen. You know, when USC goes up to Corvallis, uh, you know USC has been what like number one and undefeated like three times going up to Corvallis and lost. Uh, you know, curses, you, 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 those Washington games, that crowd, Washington is, pr- and I, I guess it can vary on the decibel meter, but Washington is the loudest or one of, you know, the top three loudest stadiums in the country, uh, right there on the lake, like just crazy stuff goes on in all of these games. And, and it's one of the things that makes the conference like pretty cool. 
And, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, we love watching about it. We don't so love it when it happens to us and we're the team that gets beat as Trojans. But, uh, it, you know, it is a real neat thing for the conference. And it's something mm-hmm. very special. Again, you got you guys have it in the Big Ten with Iowa and Illinois and Purdue, where they do the same thing. Mm-hmm. I got two more quick questions, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave the um one the uh you, if USC um loses to Utah, uh, do you think that if they if they run the table, do you think they can make the playoff, or do you think it, the loss would be too late and they would drop too far? Wait, say it again. If USC if, if USC loses to Utah, but then wins every other game and wins the Pac-12, uh, and going twelve and one, the Pac-12 South, do you think they can make the playoff, or do you think the loss will be too late? USC can it, make the playoff. It, pro- okay. it really depends on how I we're going to. Like, but I, I would be surprised. Again, I think you were looking at, you know, the scenario you're talking about and we're all looking at is a situation where you have a one loss, uh, Georgia or, or Alabama. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to be pretty hard to count out a 12 and one USC team if, mm-hmm. again, that loss isn't like an embarrassing loss. So mm-hmm. I would say, I would say, yeah, I, I believe USC could win. Could well, if, if you had like Alabama and Georgia already in there, and then Ohio State just say they're in there. What what would what would happen if you had twelve and one Utah or twelve and one USC versus eleven and one Notre Dame? With Notre Dame's only lost to Ohio State, who would they pick? Well, so if you have that with USC, USC would have probably beaten Notre Dame. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Well, if it's Utah, then mm-hmm. yeah. Um, you know that's that's gonna be. It, I, I honestly think if Utah wins out, that Phil Fulmer school of losing. If mm-hmm. Utah wins, I mean, look at look at how much we forgave Utah's early season losses last year. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had like three of them or whatever. And I mean, there were good reasons. They had, you know, they had a player die. They had the mm-hmm. quarterback situation. They had, you know, they, so they, I'm, not, I'm not saying there weren't reasons, but like we, we kind of, we kind of forgave like mm-hmm. a lot of stuff last year. And I, I think that, you know, they, they certainly, if, if they were to win out, they probably could. Um, you know, I, I think one of the other things there, and you know this from Indiana, there's something so special about the Rose Bowl. And Utah mm-hmm. got to experience it last year. And like if you saw the Utah folks, like Utah when you when Utah was in the Mountain West, I mean from them coming up to uh, join the Pac-12, they got into the AAU, and then for them to take the state of Utah to the Rose Bowl for the first time ever was something really really special, and and they got the hunger for it. And so I'll tell you what, for them to get back to the Rose Bowl and be able to have a chance to win, I think they would go crazy for it. The Rose Bowl is in USC's blood. We've been to what is it, Tim? We've been to thirty-six of them, thirty-five of them, thirty-five, I believe. Thirty, thirty. We've been to thirty-five Rose Bowls, which is bananas. So, uh, you know, that's very much in USC's blood. They would love to go to it. I, I honestly think, you know, I don't, I don't want to scoff and say like, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter if we make the playoff. But like to any of these teams right now to get a solid chance to win the conference, they would be delighted to be in Pasadena, regardless of the playoff. Mm-hmm. I think if there's a, if there's an undefeated or a one loss team, they they certainly would have as good a shot as anybody. Yeah, because it's, fu- it's funny talking about the Rose Bowl because Indiana hasn't made the Rose Bowl since 1967, and uh, and yeah, now they're gonna have to play UCLA when they join the Big Ten in a couple years. It's kind of Look funny. So. Jeffrey, you get to go to the Rose Bowl. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to get some money to fly out there. I don't know. You got a couple years to save up. You got a couple years. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, correction: thirty five is thirty four. With 25 wins. 34 with 25 wins. Okay. My last question is, if if Michael Penix stays healthy, do you think that Washington can beat, uh, can beat Oregon and win the North? Mm-hmm. I do, because he was that good at Indiana when he was healthy. Yeah, he again, he has a really special issue with that. Um, I mean, I'm really a big believer in the uh, – I wrote it down. Uh, Mc, I was watching a game, and it was uh, McMillan kid. He must have. I, I I lost track of the touchdown passes that guy. They got a really good connection. I I think that Oregon is a great team with lots of talent, but I think that they have some growing pains with, you know. I mean, not not that Washington's not doing the same thing. Uh, I I think it's going to be a dogfight. To be honest with you, if if he's if Penix stays healthy, um, and that defense, man, that defense. We're talking all about the offense and Penix. That defense looks stout too. So I I do think that they have um a really good chance to win the North. 
Yeah, okay, it first sucks of- that he got hurt because he he was really good at Indiana, man, and and he just they just could not protect him. He kept tearing his ACL. It was terrible, but uh, yeah, I, I do think they'll win the North uh, with him if if he stays healthy. Mm-hmm. All right, we, like we got we got we got some we got some heat by the way coming from our good friend Zach the Purdue fan says you're from Southern Indiana near uh Bloom you know uh, near near Bloomington Zach is from Northern Indiana near Purdue and is a devout Purdue fan so there's a little a little bit a little bit of Big Ten rivalry in the chat I like it I like it I have to say I'm not from Southern Indiana I'm from North Carolina <laughs> oh even better even better I like it yeah I'm, uh, I'm in North Carolina. Oh, no, you froze up. Well, I'll tell you what, Jeffrey, listen, if you're still out there, I don't know if you lost your connection, but if you are, um, I noticed you had uh, – do you have your own site? If you do, please post it in the chat, and we could uh, we could post a link because, man, I, I, think you're, I think you're the next Mark Rogers. you got a love for this game that makes me really smile. So uh, best right. of luck to you, bud. Yeah, be- best of luck. And, and, and join, join us anytime. We'd love to have you. Sounds good. Can't wait next time. We're I'll back. be on We're Friday back. for you the go. three. Hey, yeah, do you, yeah. do you have a channel, Jeffrey? Say again. Do you have a channel, Jeffrey? You want to plug? Uh, you, you can't. Uh, I got uh, yeah. My channels only talk sports. I started it three weeks ago. Uh, you know, doing some college uh, football well, and basketball you know, content. Uh, yeah. The like I said, only talk sports. That's just my YouTube channel. But I don't have uh, I don't have any other social media yet. But uh, just that. Okay. But thanks. Uh, in in the private chat in Streamyard, um, mm-hmm. put put the link in there, and we'll we'll share it to the group in just a minute. Mm-hmm. How, how do I do that? Uh, just, if, you, Tony, if he puts it in the regular chat, I'll copy and paste it. Perfect. Yeah, do that. Just put it in the chat, and Tim will um, Tim will copy and paste it in because we'll get every, let's get every, you guys. Let's all subscribe because you know Jeffrey's probably got a great channel. He's great to hear, and J- Jeffrey, we'd love to have you call in and chat with the tree. Yeah, thank you. I will. I can't wait. I'll do that on Friday. Thanks. All Thanks right, thank you for joining us. Good night. Thank you. See ya. All right, gang. What a night this has been. Who who else is out there? We go. There's a there's a bunch of you out there. There's a bunch of you sort of lurking. Come on, call and tell us about uh call call and tell us about about your teams. Well, I see some beavers out there. I yeah, see Zach, uh the out there. Zach, come Just come on. Please. Well, what's going to happen when Purdue when Purdue uh, when, when when Purdue starts to play some of these teams? And Connor, Connor, your beeves have a game. We have not heard from you yet. Hey, Z- and also Zona Tucson, we were pumping up your Arizona. We were saying you're one of the, te- the games of the week. Get in here and talk to us about your team, man. Yeah, Zona Tucson, you guys have the game. I mean, you guys have a chance to stick it to Mississippi State. Do you know what would happen? First of all, let's think about how all of the SEC fans. Would literally have a brain aneurysm meltdown. There's a good chance that the fish in Jeff Webster's house would stop swimming if you actually pulled that stuff up. So that would be amazing. It would. And and I mean, we, we really we we we've got the fish versus the pirate as far as the coaches go. Dead fish and Mike Leach. Oh, he kind of you're right. That's good. Jeffrey's totally awesome. And yeah, I'm hearing about how Washington has chances to to be one of the best teams in the North. And I I need Connor to stop eating dinner and come in here and explain to us about how the Beavs are winning 10 games and that Washington is an afterthought after after the chainsaws and uh, Corvallis get done with everyone else. Yeah, exactly. Cause because because Benny the Beaver has has his chainsaws ready to go. So we want to hear what's happening. Hummus Hero says, I would love to see Arizona State take it to Mississippi State. That would be awesome. It it might be able to happen, guys. We might be able to shut down the cowbells. It's going to be interesting to sort of see. NorCal Matt just pulled up at home with In N Out Burger. Okay, call and tell us about the In N Out Burger. I mi- I'm in Florida right now. I miss In N Out Burger. It is phenomenal. It is the best. All right. Who else who else is out there? So Tim, what what are your what are you going to want to ask the Stanford tree? Um, I, I'm actually you you dropped that little nugget to me that he um, has his side hustle, and so even before he gets into college, just this little school called Stanford, he he started his own esports league. Is that correct? Yeah, with, with like a six million dollar prize. I mean, it's a, it's actually a big company. Just and he's just CEO, he started it. 
I mean, it's no secret that there's exceptional people at Stanford. Like we, I know we like to mess with them, but um, it's it's just amazing to hear stories like that. So I'm just, I'm just curious to pick his mind about that kind of thing. I, just, I, I find, I don't know much about it, but I do find it fascinating. Yeah. He's a really neat guy. I'm also curious, but actually the, the big thing when you first told me is I, I really want to ask him, you know, what is the selection process to become the tree? Because I'm sure there's a lot, there's a line for that. And I'm just curious, you know, I know that, because we had the drum major at USC. So I kind of know the lineage for that. If you want to be the drum major, right? Pretty easy. But I am curious how you line up to become the tree at Stanford. That's also uh, what, 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 what resume do you need to have on there? Do you need to be a multi-million dollar um, E-League owner in order to do that? I just want to know what he says that is a criteria to become the tree. Exactly. You have, you have to be a, multi, a multi-millionaire businessman by the age of 16. And then you can be the Stanford tree. Maybe that's how it works. Uh, no, that, that is really, and, and it's twist on the Stanford tree, guys. I don't know if you know this. First of all, let's give Stanford, just remind you, Stanford wasn't always so woke. They used to be the Indians, and, and Stanford changed their name to the Cardinal in the 70s. Cardinal like the color, not like the bird, and used the, the tree from the, from their logo, uh, which, which which dates back to, uh, just, I don't know if you guys know this, Stamp, Stanford was founded by Le, by Leland Stanford, named after his son. Uh, you guys, you know the story of the Golden Spike, how they united the uh the east and west with transcontinental railroad at promissory point utah and they drove the golden spike well leland stanford was the robber baron railroad president who actually drove the golden spike so if you guys go to stanford you can actually see the golden spike itself is at stanford and and his family endowed this you know university with just an ungodly amount of money and, and left it there i think their dairy farm south of san francisco and that today is the campus and then that campus is where they literally built Silicon Valley on spare land of the campus. So the Stanford Research Park, you know, Hewlett Packard, all those companies that started there, literally started on the Stanford campus. So it's, it's an incredible place. Again, band, totally punchable, but uh, pretty awesome people. Speaking of pretty awesome people, I saw a couple Trojans rolling here. I'd love to hear from the Trojan calling. There so are again, the Trojans. We created a platform for all of us Pac-12 orphans to have a voice, and we've had some amazing calls we had a couple. We have a couple of Pac-12 people call in, but the majority I've seen have been Big Ten, and we have even had an SEC caller. Really looking forward to hearing, um, if not this week, next week, from some of you guys out there. Because I know you're lurking out there. Um, you don't have to have your camera on. Come on in, brag about your team, you vent about your team. You know, if you're a duck, tell us what went wrong. Oh, uh, speaking and of speaking of the Pacific Northwest, Eves. Let's welcome the star of the Oregon State University. Welcome, Connor Johnson. What's up, fellas? What's I'm up, still Connor? like, yeah. I'm still eating a little bit, so I'll try not. I know it's annoying. This isn't an ASMR right. food eating uh, podcast, so I'll try hey, to we- keep that to a minimum. Connor, tell us, big game for the Beavs this weekend. Biggest game probably in the history of Fresno. What do you want? What are you well, looking for? The Fresno fans are saying that, that it's going to be the biggest crowd in history. Um, I'm fairly confident. I don't think, you know, I'm not as confident again as I was against Boise, but also the team, 24 nothing at half, we put in some second string guys. We let them come back a little bit. But the things that I said needed to happen, Chance Nolan taking a step forward in the second year, like Luton did a few years ago, I mean, the deep ball, he would have had another – he had a drop pass on the first drive, a uh, 50-, 60-yard throw that Trayshawn Harrison just flat-out dropped. So – and people think of our run game first. So if, if our pass game continues the way it is – I was comparing the, the talent player by player uh, using, like, recruiting rankings and stats of Fresno and, and, our, and our guys, and we're the more talented team. I even think – Jake Hayner struggled against Cal Poly and people, ha- you know, he's a good quarterback, Heisman hopeful, but Hank Bachmeyer was also supposed to be a good quarterback. And we essentially got him benched in the second quarter. <laughs> um, you guys definitely <laughs> did. We, yeah. So, I mean, uh, we struggled. Chance Nolan made a few errors, um, but like, I, I actually kind of liked having to struggle a little bit because it, there was stuff the coaches could teach. And we're probably up there in the top of the, the conference for coaching staff and developing players and scheming guys. So if there's stuff that – like, I think this team's going to get better every week. And to start out where we started out, 
I personally knew it was coming, but I couldn't be too cocky because this is the same team that was the worst power five team five years ago when Jonathan Smith took over. Now, Connor, needless to say, yeah, go for it, Tim. Well, I was just going to ask you, tell us about Fenwick, probably one of the better running backs that nobody knows about. You guys are hiding him up there in Corvallis. Yeah. Um, I said last week, uh, I think he's our, our bruiser. Um, he's a downhill runner. He had a fumble the first drive, which I think hurt his confidence a little bit. But um, it's not just him. This freshman, Damian Martinez, is going to get time. Um, and then Trey Lowe, the third down back, um, the running game is is fine. I mean, people were saying, oh, B.J. Baylor's gone. It'll hurt. But the O-line's back, and like the scheme is back. It's just we play hard mouth SEC-style football, but we can air it out. Like, uh, Jonathan Smith is the – so I want to go back to what Search was saying to compare us to Washington. When Peterson stepped down – Jonathan Smith was his offensive coordinator and Jimmy Lake was his defensive coordinator. And if you look at that, I mean, sure, Jimmy Lake had more experience and the defense was better, but there was still a choice to be made. If we're going to promote within, I'm sure they were talking about Jonathan Smith too. They didn't promote Jonathan Smith and that offense the last few years has been horrendous, which just goes to show how important Smith is to our offense. And it's the best offense after one week, um, like Mark does is, you know, the results on the field matter. It it had the best results. I mean, maybe Jaden Delora can, can make a – and we struggled with Jaden Delora from Wazoo. We haven't beaten Wazoo in years. There's still that rivalry that, like, uh, I hate to – if Ben or Eric are listening and I'm going to call us or the little brother, I hate that. But Wazoo <laughs> and us, we share a lot of similar – like Tony was saying, the ag schools, which on that topic – we uh yeah we have like the greatest marine biology program we the research grants that we get um are amazing it's definitely the better school between oregon and oregon state i, uh, I mean they, don't you guys have i think you have a lot more research than oregon state don't you or, than oregon don't you yeah we're the science when i chose to come to school here um i long story but i, I had the gi bill to use which is free school and i I knew I wanted to be a science student. And when you're looking at Oregon, Oregon State, uh, Oregon State's the more science school. And Corvallis is a way better college town. Um, so I, I, I get sad when people talk about realignment and, and forget to talk about us and, and Wazoo. Yeah, I, I, think, and is, I, I think people make a big mistake about in doing that because you guys in Wazoo are awesome schools that have a lot of awesome tradition and people don't necessarily understand yeah. that. And some of you guys may not know this, but Oregon State was the first Heisman Trophy winning school on the West Coast. Tony Baker, he barely threw the ball. But... Yeah, he didn't throw the ball, but he was a quarterback. And not only that, but he led them as a Cinderella to the Final Four. Yeah. Literally, their Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, for, again, before any USC players won a Heisman Trophy, was, was Oregon State. And, and they, they did it under – 62. I was going to ask you the year, 62. Okay. I think, I think it's 62. I could, give or take one. I think it's 62, though. And, and that actually was one of the big, the big pushes that then got you guys back. Because you had a president, A.L. Strand, who was a complete douchebag who, like, sort of got Oregon State, like, joined the wrong click when the, when the schools were fighting in the Pacific Coast Conference. And so once he was gone, it was literally the, as soon as he retired, uh, Oregon and Oregon State were invited to join the Pac 12. Because they, they, everyone who was like on the wrong side of the click had to go away. But yeah, so much great tradition, and 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 you guys really get shorted on it. People do not understand that there is a lot of rich tradition at Wazoo and at Oregon State. A lot of people don't realize that Oregon State has probably cost USC more national championships than the other OSU. So, yeah, they have yeah. one. They so, have I mean, one. Three, I can think of three off the top of my head that have been crushed yeah. by the Beavers. Literally three national championships we would probably have if it weren't for the darn Beavers. You would and never, and for, I don't think for Ohio those still listening, I mean, where does USC travel to to play Oregon State this year? That's not yeah, the question. I'll tell you. If, <laughs> if you want to um, if you want to really terrify a USC person, speaking of ASMR, just like say really quietly in their ear, Corvallis. 
<laughs> Friday night. A rainy, raining. <laughs> I'm not too worried, uh, Connor. Here's the reason why I'm not worried about going to Corvallis this year because we're not going to be sniffing a national championship. So I think we win this one. If, if well, we, we have half the, the stadium, hunt, then maybe too. maybe I'd be worried, but we're not going to be the hunt for a title this year. So it'll be. You your should be worried. Up. <laughs> should we have to? I'm, to, I'm terrified. <laughs> No, y'all are downplaying it, though, so that if you do lose, it'll be okay. But you have the more talented team. But our coaching, I don't know. We play way above our talent level. It's Well, wild. again, you, you have continuity. Yeah, I, I, I am a big believer. You know, and hurt really, Oregon, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, Jonathan Smith has it rolling. I really think you guys are building something up there. And I, and it's, I can't believe there are days when someone said this, this is his fifth year. I couldn't believe that this is already his fifth year. But you know uh, what? What he's doing up there is legit, and and I, I'm I'm saying if we lose, we lose. I wouldn't. I'm the very beginning of the year. One of the games I circled as a possible loss was the Corvallis effect, and was the fact that just as a respect to I how well prepared I know your defense is going to be, and I know how how good those Jonathan Smith offenses are. So I mean, I'm I'm not going to be remotely shocked if we're in a dogfight, and it's not going to be a huge. I don't think it's going to be a huge a story if you actually beat us. So, I mean. His game management and, like, uh, like decision-making is also top-notch. The Jonathan Smith is straight up, like, one of the best coaches in the country, I think, that people outside of the West Coast have no idea about. I don't think people know his name. I don't think so everybody knows. Know. I just got word from the tree. It looks like it's going to be at 6 Eastern, uh, 3 Pacific. All right, right in between class for him. Yeah, right in between class. I think he's got some stuff on Friday evening. Anyway, we'll we'll sort out that we we'll get the exact details coming up. I wanted to touch on what Serge was saying about Jonathan Smith to like to and Tim made me think of this too. Five years is a, is a fairly long time with COVID year. You could more like four, but he legitimately went from like where like one hundred thirtieth team program. They were awful and. And he did it. He's probably the last coach in the last program that will do a traditional old school style turnaround where we're not, we weren't, I mean, we had a few transfers in 2018, 2019, but it was, we didn't rely on them and, and transfer market wasn't what it is now back then. So he was, he did it the right way and he recruits players. He, he played here. He was our quarterback last time we were good, beat Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl. So he knows how to get kids up here that want to be up here. And I mean, we do have talent. Don't get me wrong. Luke, Luke Musgrave is going to be an NFL tight end. Um, and I think we have just enough talent combined with the coaching staff to be like Mark made us the sleeper, but like, I just want to start with the pack 12. I mean, we're a sleeper to win the pack. If we beat Fresno state this weekend, the same way we beat Boise and we start off the, the pack 12 conference beating USC and Utah back to back. Even if we split those four and one, we'll be ranked nationally. Um, yeah. We might be ranked if we beat Fresno, but nobody knows who Jonathan Smith is east of Colorado. <laughs> Fans may not know who Jonathan Smith is, but there's a lot of ADs out there that do know. But since Jonathan Smith is a you know an ex quarterback for you guys, and he's definitely a, a Beaver for life. The only yeah, way he's not going anywhere. Be one day, I think he's good enough that he might get some looks from NFL teams at some point, and that's when you gotta get nervous. But he's not going anywhere soon, so. Uh, you no, guys he, and I love, I love the story that when when he came into interview that you know they were looking at all these coaches, all these head and he head coaching experience, and he came in with that Fiesta Bowl ring from the greatest year in Oregon State history. I didn't said, know that. I know how to build this team. What? Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, he, cool. he made a big deal that he came in with a plan, and he told them, this is the plan, and it's going to take four years because you have a terrible team. But he said, I, I was here when we built the team up once, and I'll be here and I'll do it again. With making sure to, to hold up that ring to be like, yeah, I, I was here when we did this. We don't have Chad Johnson this time, though. No, no that did not. No, That did not. <laughs> those, those both, I, 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 I can't lie, those both helped a little bit. Yeah, Denny Erickson, okay. who I love. I used I, so I used to know Denny Erickson. My dad uh, used to go down and wow. scheme offenses with the Miami staff when he was at, at Miami, so, and he's an awesome guy. But yeah, like you know, a lot of things were flexible into the Erickson years, and and 
And Jonathan Smith's a little more buttoned down, but he, I mean, he's gone around and learned from the best at that tree you know, is a, that's an underappreciated coaching tree. Dennis yeah, Erickson. Denny, Erickson, Avalos. Yeah, Denny Erickson plus Chris Peterson. That's a, yeah. Those, oh, those are not Peterson, bad yeah. mentors. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, even, uh, what's the guy that went to Nebraska and screwed them over? Even he had a few, Riley. Mike Riley. He even had a good period when we were decent 10 years ago with Brandon. A proud, Cox, a proud Trojan, teams. we might add. I mean, he's somebody oh, that he? we, he, he had, so they tried to hire him. And he was he one year with the with San Diego, and so he, he would wouldn't take the job, and we ended up instead with the guy who washed out with the Patriots. Some uh, what was his oh, name? Wow. Pete something that worked out. Tim would have to help you out. Yeah, well, exactly. I think, I think people who say that we're okay, that we will be all right if we go to the Mountain West, we could dominate. We may not be able to afford Jonathan Smith if we go to the Mountain West. First of all, you're not going to go to the Mountain West because that's a stupid thing. Um, I hope what, you're right, but what they would do is backfill the pack. The pack, the, just just for anybody who doesn't understand this, and and some people don't know this. There's a thing. It, the Power Five is a fake term. It's a fake, stupid media term. The real term is A Five. It means Autonomy Five. There are five conferences that are granted legislative special powers by the NCAA, and they are the ACC, the Pac-12, the Big Ten, the SEC, and the Big Twelve. And so the Pac-12 is one of those five conferences that has special powers. So the Pac-12 isn't going to go anywhere. Teams would even in a even in your worst DEFCON one scenario that you know the doofuses from like you know Arizona websites like to talk about or whatever. Like you're going to have the Pac-12 continue to exist. And I know that that will cause a stroke to the other doofus who like writes a blog or whatever in I don't know if it's Oklahoma or Nebraska or whatever that's always talking about like the death of the Pac-12 and these I think it's a idiots. Baylor guy. Uh well there, there's there's a oh. bunch of them that just are idiots that, that don't uh, they literally don't understand like basic concepts of how conferences work. So what you would see is you would see actually even in the Defcon scenario they they would backfill the Pac-12 because the Pac the Pac-12 has special legislative powers that other conferences don't have and that schools want to be a part of. So you know, now, even if even if the four corners go to the Big 12 and Stanford, Cal, Oregon, Washington go to the Big 10, that leaves Wazoo and us. So first, first of all, you're probably not going to see that happen um, because the Big 10 is probably not going to take the other four schools. I and think I look at Twitter too much. Yeah, you do look at – yeah, exactly, because that's really not likely to happen, quite honestly. The the math on the Big 10, they're, they're pretty clear about that, so it's probably not going to happen. The other thing is that, first of all, Oregon is not going anywhere with Oregon right now is presidentless. And and the interim president of Oregon is not going to take you guys, it's not going to go anywhere other than the Big Ten. And the Big Ten isn't going to take Oregon. So Oregon's not going anywhere. Cal, Stanford, you guys, Washington are all right now kind of locked together. And you're not going to go anywhere. The other thing is people forget, like Arizona State, they want to hang out with AAU schools. How many AAU schools are in the Big yeah. 12? One. Yeah. One, and it's one who's hanging on by a thread. Yeah, you guys, you want your conglomeration of AAU schools teamed up together in, or, in Oregon, and, AAU, and, and, and we have the, it, the research again. It's just it's a silly thing, you know. Don't listen to these Twitter nitwits. Well, the Big Twelve is on defense, and they've been scared ever since Texas, Oklahoma left. But their situation is not our situation. You have not to at look all. at it as a whole. I think the West Coast time slot is huge. I think the the better schools um we could stick with 10 i don't want them trying to steal san diego state we might need to jump on that um maybe fresno uh, this is all so we don't uh, people don't want to hear this this is football season back yeah exactly we got games back. back but but the big thing the beeves are back and i'll tell you again the stuff that a lot of you're hearing is doofus stuff a lot of it's like idiots who are hoping and, yeah. and some, yeah. some like you know there's some Just ptsd in a few of the fan communities uh, let me just be real clear that when we talk about these idiots, we're not talking about Baylor. We're not talking about West Virginia because you don't hear it from those two. You hear it from some of the other, the lesser, the lesser programs and schools that don't have a lot of history. West Virginia well, is like, scared. A, they are, they're scared. And, and they also are kind of bitter because every one of them tried to join the PAC 12 and the PAC 12, literally all 12. So sure it's people just, watching don't like us right now. The well, they like, well, remember certain, certain areas of the country don't like the West coast anyway. Yeah, and they don't like New York. The difference is New York doesn't care; the West Coast cares a little bit. Oregon is so beautiful, like, and they're so nice. The people are so nice. 
Maybe not on Twitter. Actually, no. California. Let's be honest. Oregon Twitter spaces, that's a scary place. I know. Well, the Duck fans, they're more of a they're they're a big brand with a bunch of loud people that like the colors and played NCAA football. I don't think most of those fans who are talking shit are from Oregon. Not not well, Ryan Winter's a perfect example. He's a great guy. I think we need you're to right. get him on here. Can we get Ryan Winter on here? We should get Ryan Winter on here. I think we should. Next week. Let's try it. Right. We, have, we have a Stanford okay. tree. Why don't we get Ryan Winter? Yeah, he's a great second guest. Those two guests back to back to start the show. It'd be awesome. Come on. Now, I'll tell you, we're, I, I, I tried to I tried to see if we could get puddles, but I'm told that, that puddles and Benny are more Instagram style than, than Twitter style. Yeah, I don't know who's the Benny for, for right now. I graduated already. So Yeah, like like Benny with a chainsaw would actually be kind of awesome, wouldn't it? Yeah. It Maybe cool. we should just try getting a a, a duck call, fan to call in at some point. I think, do we know any duck fans? I th- I think Eric has been in hiding. Yeah, where is it? Actually, I think Eric's at work right now. Unfortunately, which is too bad. He works. Oh, nice. Yeah, we we need, we could use some Eric. We could use some Eric. We're short. Eric, we're summoning you. Well, before I go finish my dinner, last thank, last thank week way I called. Uh, of course, yeah. Uh, search. Uh, a couple people were saying so, and I I you know I know I've overstayed my welcome, but. Last week Never. I did a score prediction on air, and I, I was scared to say a three-score win, but that's how I felt. And I think I ended up going with 31-17, and it was 34-17. So I'm going to try again. Tell us. I'm going to go 45, because it's going to be close and we have to score more, to 31. Two-score game this time. Two-score game? I like it. Let's go, Beebs. Go, Beebs. Hey, thanks, thanks Connor. Guys. We'll see you next time. Cheers, fellas. Hey, guys, um, if you could do us a favor to help grow the show, uh, please take a second to hit the like button. It only takes a second, and it really would help us grow the show. We, 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 we do. And, guys, we really appreciate Thank you, guys. I mean, there's been a bunch of you, and you've been with us for, like, this whole time. It it really means a lot to us. We really appreciate it. You know, we, we kind of do this for fun. So we, we really appreciate you guys spending the evening with us. Speaking of fun, who's this guy? You said you wanted a duck fan. Well, <laughs> quack, 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 quack. <laughs> the number one fan of the Miami Ducks. Yeah, uh, yeah, you got it right here, man. What a great show you guys got going. T- Tony, I am like, like in awe over, over what you're doing with these graphics and you're making the, the rest of us look bad. Far um, from it. <laughs> I mean, gee, gee, gee whiz. I, I, I come in, I'm watching the show. I'm like, he got all these cool graphics coming up. It looks all organized. This is like the second show of the, of the Pac-12 show, and it's already like blowing everything out of the water. Jesus <laughs> Christ, man. C- c- come on yeah, now. We appreciate having you. We, uh, you know, we try, we try to make it fun. We try to, you know, give folks give folk some laughs and uh, have some chuckles. And uh, like I said, we're real excited. We've got coming up on a special show on Friday. The Stanford Tree is going to be live to chat about all things football, esports, Stanford trees, uh, the world's wildest band. It's going to be a good time. I know. I, I saw that on Twitter. I, I was like, you were like trolling the Stanford Tree, and I thought we were going to have to get serious on the Stanford Tree for a minute. I thought I, I was going right. to have to go. I thought I was going to have to go full like troll on Stanford Tree, but then you said, "Oh, the Stanford Tree is actually coming on," and I was like, "Oh, that, thank God," because. The Stanford Tree's got a pretty good troll game, and I, he does. I was, uh, yeah, do I, I, I was actually doing my push-ups and stuff, getting ready for that one. So. Yeah, I, one of one of the USC beat reporters, very funny enough, just admitted defeat from the Stanford Tree and just posted on Twitter, guys. I just got owned by a tree on Twitter. I mean, the tree's been fighting with uh, the New York State Building. Um, the, <laughs> the tree has been fighting with uh, who was the other person the tree just took down? There's there's so many I don't not even know person who is. not person but like um and there was something else besides the New York New York State Building yeah. and I was like yeah I really don't want to go to battle with this guy so I'm so glad he came on because, <laughs> because I was ready I was ready to go to battle for you Tony it is, thank I, you I was yeah, ready it, it is yeah if you try to take on the tree on Twitter you're gonna have an easier time taking the beach in Normandy than taking right. on the <laughs> no I was looking forward to the challenge but that's all I'm saying about that. <laughs> But I, uh, I really, I really love the show you guys are doing. I, I've been watching from the moment you started till, till now, reading the chats. It's been fun. 
Um, oh, thanks. And, yeah. and thank you guys in the chat too. We've had, we've had a great fun discussion here in the chats. I love it. Um, yeah. Dodger, Dodger. We might, we may look at Dr. Rice later in the time. I, I actually sort of used to work for her. I used to work with U S embassies and I, you know, she's a really, really, um, you know, whether you agree with her politically or not, and there's a lot of things we disagree on, but she's a really, really neat lady, brilliant, um, and, and, and has been a phenomenal force for good of good stuff at Stanford. Um, she's also, you know, one of the first females uh, admitted to Augusta National, so she's kind of a badass with a green jacket. So we'll hopefully get her there. That's not too far from UTF. Right. Well, one of the smartest things I've found is to... Uh... Leave, leave any of that kind of nonsense behind and talk about college football because that's why exactly. we're all here together. <laughs> well, and, and Dr. Rice has always said that the only, and in fact, when, when President Bush appointed her, he said, I'm appointing her Secretary of State because I can't give her the job she really wants, which is Commissioner of the NFL. Right, right, exactly. And, and she's, you know, a, a, a very uh, wonderful woman. Yeah, big football fan. Too, so. Exactly, exactly. A very cool person. That's what but, we need. We need yeah. more football fans. Speaking of football, famous uh, Stanford alums, Gary Lewis says Jim Plunkett's on social. Reach out to him. Cool dude. Oh, we I should. Would, I would love that. Raider, ex-Raider. Jim Plunkett Jim. would be awesome. Heisman Trophy winner, right? He won a Heisman at, at Stanford, didn't he? I think, I think so. He? I think he did. Yeah, Tell me out, chat. I don't yeah, know if he did. Didn't he? We think he did. I thought he did. Anyway. So uh, let, yeah, let me ask you guys one question. TF is hosting Mark Rogers voice of college football, Miami post games this year. And as you guys know, the Trojans are back and the Huskies are back. And also the U is back. Well, yes. I mean, t Tony's right there with me. And I know all you people are going to hate me now, but yeah, so, so let's go away from that. This is a Pac-12 show, so, so we will stay away from that as far as possible. But now I, I just came on here actually to, to tell you guys what a good job you were doing and how much I was enjoying watching watching this show. And I'm not a Pac-12 guy. Um, I noticed JW came on here and told you all about how he appreciated watching <laughs> your Pac-12 show that earlier. So nice. That was so kind of him. <laughs> we really appreciated it. <laughs> but I, I, won't, I won't hold you up. I just wanted to come on and say, say great show, guys. Um, I, I'll still be in the chat, hanging out. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, on Friday for uh, the Stanford Tree and then Friday night for some trivia. Oh, oh, and and by the way on that, it, if I could take two seconds, Friday Absolutely. night on trivia is going to be on Pigskin Peach channel. Ooh, oh, even wow. better. We love yeah, because but that is his... Uh, 24 hour live stream on Pixie and Pete's channel for his 5,000 subscribers. So, well, that's we exciting. Will, we'll yeah, be there. We'll be, yeah, we will be doing trivia there. So, we got to figure that out, do some logistics. So, Tony, Tim, we'll uh, chat. Yeah, text text me tomorrow so, so we can make okay. make all this happen. Cool. cool. Fight all on, guys. TF. All right, lo love, you love you guys and uh, love, love the show. And everybody, make sure you hit that thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to this channel because it is awesome we'll see you guys later Love thanks, you later, Jeff. thanks yeah. again yeah charlie fools make sure you drop your link also he's got a great travel uh channel if you guys like watching great videos especially you guys like tropical locations make sure you hit up his uh hopefully he'll put it in the in the chat but make sure you check out his channel all right well guys we are hitting we are hitting about two hours here which is i Figured we'd go an hour, so I can't believe we went over again. Uh, and that's because of you guys. We, we're really glad to have you guys spend some time with us and spend some time chatting about the Pac-12. And, and I, I really want to give a special thank you to, you know, the folks who are fans of, like, like JW, um, you know, uh, like, like everybody else who, who's called in tonight and who's, who's joined us, who, you know, aren't necessarily Pac-12 fans, but are, you know, just just love, love to chat football and understand that, like, there are really, really neat institutions with neat fan bases and neat traditions on the West Coast. And, uh, you know, we love having you guys watch those teams. Uh, you know, I, I went to a school on the East Coast. I went to school on the West Coast. They're pretty different. Um, but there, there's great people everywhere. And we, we really appreciate your sharing the night with us.
So, Tim, as we, we wrap up, any final words for the folks? Or as I can yeah. start with Chris? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, I'm good. Uh, looking forward to the week. And uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out. And Chris, um, to, to your Bruin community, on behalf of the whole conference, I think I'd safe to say, uh, really cool, cool, cool thing happening this weekend with UCLA hosting Alabama State. Can't wait to see the Marching Hornets in the Rose Bowl. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Now, just don't do the most Pac-12 thing ever and lose that game, okay? It's that's of all. It's that's not possible. Yeah, we would hope so. It would be the most Pac-12 thing ever, though, for you to go like undefeated and lose only that game. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm just really excited um, to see USC play. Um, you know, a, a P5 school to see if what we saw last Saturday. Uh, can be replicated against, again, um, P5 athletes. I think it might be. And again, I'm also really excited to watch um, and see if Arizona can keep it going. I know they got a tough task, um, but I, I would love to see them uh, show out and hopefully come with a victory. But if not, just, you know, show the SEC that we could ball out here on the West Coast and, you know, they get their shot. You know, Utah did a good job. Um, Oregon's maybe a couple of year, a year, a couple away, but, um, I would, this is one more opportunity for the conference to stand up and say, Hey, you know, maybe you should take us a little bit seriously. So really interested to see that game as well. Well, I agree. And again, on behalf of everybody with Mark Rogers, voice of college football channel, we want to thank you guys for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. We'll see you hopefully on Friday. It looks like it's going to be about 6 PM Eastern, 3 PM Pacific for our special USC pregame with the Sanford tree. And uh, Tim and I will also be live uh, on Mark's channel when the USC game ends after the Stanford games. We hope you'll join us. Thank you guys really, truly from the bottom of our hearts for spending the, uh, a couple hours with us tonight. And we'll see you soon. Fight on Pac-12.